Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Aaron Harburg. I am a certified information privacy professional with the International Association of Privacy Professionals. I'm currently in the legal department at SuperRare Labs. I'm here in my personal capacity and not as a representative of SuperRare Labs. However, my question slash comment does concern this. Is there any future plans to discuss the effects of blockchain technology in particular on privacy issues? Uh, and that is pretty much my only comment or question. Thank you very much, um, Aaron. And I will um, at this point remind the uh, folks who've been in our meetings before and for any of you who have not been in our meetings before, the board um, is listening. Um, we can't respond to comments directly um, in most cases during a meeting, um, but please don't take that as that we are not paying attention, we are. And thank you for the comment. Um, Mr. Sultani or Mr. Souble, I noticed the recording just started. Um, is that all right? Do we need to, do I need to run through the announcements again? I would just to be, um, uh, just to be safe and we're gonna record it. And I think the press office link had an issue with their computer and it rebooted. So um, oh. the recording started at the moment you heard uh, that announcement. So if we could just briefly redo the roll call, that'd be great. Okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I, I thank uh, in advance the board and the public for their um, patience while um, we cover the, um, the important announcements and sort of parameters for the meeting. Um, so once again, good morning. It is September 23rd, 2022. It is 9-11 a.m. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the California Privacy Protection Agency Board's um, September 23rd, 2022 meeting. I'm Jennifer Urban, and I'm chairperson of the board of the agency. I'd like to um, let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded and to request that everyone um, be sure their microphone is muted when they're not speaking. As with all of our meetings, um, this meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members after every agenda item. And there will also be um, uh, an opportunity for, um, uh, for comments by the public after every agenda item. And uh, we also have a designated item on the agenda for general public comments, which is agenda item eight today. Please be aware that each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item for public comment. And if you are speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must um, uh, contain their comments to that agenda item. The public does have that opportunity for general comment under agenda item number eight. In addition, agenda item number nine today is an item for the proposal of future agenda items uh, for consideration for discussion in future board meetings. And both board members and members of the public are welcome to suggest uh, future board, uh, excuse me, future agenda items at that time. We will take some breaks if we need them, um, which may include a break for lunch. Um, I am grateful to the board members for their service um, and to the public for its participation and to everyone who's working today um, to help make this meeting possible. Um, Mr. Sible, I will call the meeting um, to order again and ask that you please conduct the roll call vote so that we can establish a quorum on the recording. Ms. Del Torre. Present. Mr. Lay. Present. Ms. Sierra. Present. Mr. Thompson. Present. Ms. Urban. Present. Madam. Uh, Chair, you all are present and accounted for. You have established a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Souble. Um, we have established a quorum for the meeting. Um, I would like to remind board members that we will take roll call votes if we do have any action items today. Um, we then um, uh, move to agenda item number two, an update on the strategic planning process. Board members have multiple times expressed in meetings the desire for a strategic planning process, particularly as we're developing the agency and building it. Um, and that is something that um, I think every board member has expressed a desire for at one point or another. Um, I appreciate the board's attention to this and to the fact that careful strategic planning is crucial as we structure the agency and our work. Um, I, after I researched strategic planning processes at state agencies, 
I discovered that um, it is the usual practice uh, to hire an outside consultant to help with a formal strategic planning process. And I have asked our deputy director of administration to, do, to work on procuring for us a consultant with the appropriate experience. This does need to go through the state contracting process without our direct involvement. And when that process um, is ready, we will, um, I'll bring this back to the board meeting and we can kick off the strategic planning process. Um, I did ask the deputy director of administration to ensure that the request for proposals requires that the board be involved in the early stages of the process, uh, that is defining the main questions and the objectives. Um, uh, and then of course each consultant has a process they follow to, to flesh all of that out. Um, I asked for questions or comments from board members. There weren't any at that time, um, but I'll pause to see if um, something has occurred to someone um, in the interim. Okay, thank you. Um, we had one public comment on this item, and I'll pause to see if we have additional public comments since we had to go back to the top um, once the recording started. All right, um, hearing uh, no additional public comment and thanking the board and the public for their patience as we dealt with the technical glitch, um, I will now um, ask us to move on to agenda item number three, which is an update from our executive director, Mr. Ashkan Sultani, on organization and hiring and um, budget. Mr. Sultani, please, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to go over the budget today. Um, just a quick reminder, budget change proposals for the upcoming year are confidential until approved by the governor and published in the annual budget. However, in this short update, I plan to provide a high-level overview of last year's expenditures and go over current year, that's fiscal year 22-23 BCP, which was approved in July as well as giving some contours about our fiscal posture moving forward. As was previously discussed, our baseline funding is allocated by statute. Specifically, the CPRA, sorry, the CPRA appropriated from the general fund 5 million in our first year and roughly 10 million inflation adjusted in the following years to support the operations of the agency. In our first year prior to my appointment, the initial expenditures of the agency were quite minimal as staff weren't yet appointed and the agency had limited operations. As such, with the help of BCSH, the chair directed the bulk of our funds to an architectural revolving fund to support facilities expenditures at such time as we undertake the development of new offices. Last year, following my appointment, the agency's priority was staffing up and putting into place key operations to support the agency's core function, which were rulemaking and public awareness. Our primary expenditures for fiscal year 21-22 were as follows. The largest single category of expenditure was HR, consisting of salaries, wages, and benefits for our recently hired staff. Next, our individual contracts with operational agencies made up the bulk of our expenses the largest of which were the Department of Consumer Affairs, who manages our IT, the Department of General Services that handles HR, payroll, contracting, and other support functions, and the Department of Justice, which as our statute contemplates, have been supporting us with legal and logistical needs. Beyond the expenses outlined above, our general operating expenditures were quite minimal as we've maintained a primarily telework posture which then resulted in minimal outlay in terms of facilities and other operational costs. Lastly, we allocated the remainder of our fiscal year 21-22 uh, budget into a multi-year contract to fulfill one of our primary statutory obligations, public awareness and consumer education. This proactive approach was taken as we'll have limited funds in future years given our current staffing trajectory thereby making it prudent to begin budgeting in advance for these efforts. The awareness subcommittee will have an update on our initial public awareness efforts later this morning. Looking forward, our priority will continue to be staffing in order to fulfill our core obligations. We've staffed up pretty, oh wait. There's a call, I'm sorry. 
sorry, there's a technical glitch. Um, sorry about that. There was a technical glitch on my end. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back. Looking forward, our priority will continue to be staffing in order to fulfill our core obligations. We've staffed up pretty successfully this year and have almost doubled in size, uh, even since the last board meeting. Based on our current hiring plan set out in the fiscal year 22-23 BCP, we'll be at approximately 24 employees by the end of this month, and we'll be closer to the planned 34 positions by the end of this calendar year. With the appointment of the general counsel, the legal division will be nearly fully staffed. Next, our hiring focus will be on the public awareness and IT teams. And in fact, we're presently recruiting for the leads of public affairs and the information technology office. Those positions are, leaded, are listed on our career opportunities portion of our website, and we'll be soliciting applications until the end of this month. Following those appointments, we'll then begin recruiting for the enforcement lead, the chief auditor, and eventually the initial complement of the enforcement and audit teams. Though note, the, fis the fiscal year 2223 BCP did not include staffing for enforcement and audit divisions beyond just hiring those heads, uh, as we have yet to begin those functions until July 2023 at the earliest. Our expenditures, sorry, our XR, our HR expenditures will continue to rise as we continue to grow our team and bring in additional functions in house. In addition, while we plan to maintain a remote first telework posture for the near term, we may incur additional facilities costs as we expand our physical presence and pursue more of a hybrid workforce. This will include additional office spaces in Sacramento and subleases in major metropolitan areas such as LA and San Francisco. The financial year 22-23 BCP that was approved by the governor in July is available on the De Department of Finance website and detailed expenditures for financial year 21-23 that I outlined uh, above also are publicly available if the board should want further detail. Um, I'll pause there and I'd be happy to take any questions or go into any more detail about the points above. Thank you uh, Ms. very much, Mr. Sultani. Um, I have a couple of comments and then um, I would also like to hear from the board. First of all, thank you very much for um, what I think is just tremendous work, um, staffing up the agency thoughtfully and uh, making us real, <laughs> making us genuine um, in what is really a very short timeline. So I'm very impressed with what you have accomplished. I also appreciate the thoughtful use of our budget allocation. And um, especially I wanna highlight, um, it will be no surprise to anyone that I'm very excited about our public awareness function um, and so I definitely want to um, highlight that and thank you for thinking ahead um, so that we have that um, funding ready to go and that we can fulfill that function. Um, I, um, I, will, I look forward to looking at last year's BCP in more detail um, uh, now that it's public. And um, I just wanna thank you for all the great work and ask if other board members have comments or questions. Please use raise your hand or just raise your hand and I will recognize you. Uh, Ms. De La Torre, Mr. Lay, and then Ms. Sierra. Ms. De La Torre. Uh, first, I want to echo the awards of the chairperson, Irvin. Um, we are, you know, having started where we started, which was just the board members and seeing actual very talented and dedicated employees uh, joining the effort. It, it has been a great experience and I appreciate the work that is behind it, which is significant. Um, I have a separate comment, but if uh, Chairman Urban um, agrees. I would like to leave it for the end to enable the other board members to make their comments, which I think will, will be more aligned. Mine is going to take us into a little bit of a different um, topic of within course. the budget. Of course, Ms. De La Torre, I will make sure to return to you. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I also wanted to echo um, Chair Urban's words and appreciations. I, I'll just say, from my experience working the subcommittees, um, you know, the support that we've gotten, the hires that have come in have made our work uh, a lot faster 
than than we could do a year ago, even six months ago. So um, I know I know the public and other stakeholders are you know wondering um, you know what what the agency is up to, and I think the staffing up has been you know, really instrumental in, in moving us a lot faster. And and um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Sierra? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I too um, want to thank the executive director. I think this is just really fabulous. I'm just so impressed. I mean, I've done a lot of hiring in my time too, and I, I know it can be very challenging. You know, there's a lot of um, behind the scenes work that has to be done um, with respect to state service. So with all that, I'm just so impressed. I can't believe that, you know, what you're, you're doing, hiring so many people and in so many different areas of your office or our office, which also makes it, you know, really impressive. And um, I've also been really delighted to work with the new staff that we have had an opportunity to work with and the quality has been really exceptional. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Thompson? Thank you. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, also wanted to voice my appreciation for what has been accomplished so far. Um, I think the the diligence and the skill and the work ethic that the staff has demonstrated has been really exceptional. And you know, I think the public should feel very good about what about the value they're getting from this agency and the staff. Um, you know, the the amount of work that the, this small team has cranked out is is really, really impressive. And and thank you to the executive director and to, to the rest of the staff who are who are um, doing that every day um, from early in the morning to late at night. Um, we have had you know this starting a new agency is challenging with the interplay of a lot of sometimes contradictory um, frameworks that, that we have to operate in. And one of I wanted to ask a little bit about the budget change proposal process and how that interplays with Bagley Keen and how we're going to do that on a go forward basis, um, sequence wise. Um, and and if, if I heard correctly, um, wanted to see what we can do to. Per, I'll express a concern and then see what we can do to address it. It, it what it my understanding is is that. The staff developed the, the budget change proposal. Obviously, we have a, a under the, the ballot measure that established us, we have a statutory provision of funds that is, I, th I think, kind of a path. Uh, the, the, the normal legislative budget process is some, somewhat pro forma as it relates to the allocation of the money that was provided in the ballot measure. And then we, as an agency, through the staff, propose how to use that money through the budget change proposal process. Um, and as you mentioned at the top, Mr. Soltani, um, the budget change proposals are confidential until approved by the governor. Um, how we can get into a sequence, uh, so it sounds like the sequence is the staff develops the, the BCP, submits them to, I guess, the Office of Finance or Department of Finance, and, and they're approved in the governor's office, and then they become proposed public, which, at which point they are available to the public and to the board. And my question is, well, my concern is that that sequence seems odd um, in that the board should have some oversight uh, and awareness of the budget, I think, prior to its submission to, to the governor. Um, and is there a mechanism with our bag 18 requirements to consider those budget change proposals in closed session or, or some other mechanism so that we can have an awareness of them and, and opine on them prior to their submission, uh, approval by the governor's office and was subject to their revision uh, and making them public. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And before Mr. Soltani responds, I just wanted to um respond a little bit to Mr. Thompson and, and add on to that and maybe embroider a little bit. So um, it is it is an interesting and um, slightly surprising to me process, particularly because our baseline funding is allocated in our statute. 
but the legislature provides very important public oversight um, of how the agency is proposing to spend that money, which I, I do think is a valuable process. Um, it was a little surprising to me that the budget change proposals are confidential until they go into the governor's budget. Um, but I do understand that I believe the idea behind that is that the Department of Finance is able to vet everything. Um, the governor's office is able to um, figure out what their budget proposals overall are going to be. And we're in there in a little bit of an odd way because we have this already um, allocated money in our statute, but we get rolled up into that. And then as soon as it goes, it's approved um, as the governor's budget and goes to the legislature, then it is available for comment. And I think that that could be an appropriate time for the board to discuss it if we would like to. Um, the budget has not at that point been fully approved um, and um, it's, it would certainly be amenable, um, I'm sure, to, to discussion. Um, uh, so I think that that might be um, a helpful way to move forward without, um, without compromising the general um, ability of the staff and the, our control agencies to put together the budget in the first place. Mr. Sultani, I think you have more insight into this than anyone. Um, please tell me if I just got that completely wrong um, or if that if I got the sequence correct. Indeed, and I'll just flag that um, the budget is to reflect the board's general guidance in terms of priorities mm -hmm. and, and yeah. um, kind of direction. So I think we when, when I came on in November, we did have an update, which is to say that my focus is on staffing and then uh, and then we kind of uh, had later conversations about public awareness, but that was to be reflected in at least the initial BCP of how we staff and what portions of the agency we staff, for example, that we didn't staff uh, enforcement out this year because we don't begin that function until next year. So, it, you know, the, the kind of general um, processes the board provides inputs in terms of not just long term strategic priorities, but kind of um, annual priorities in terms of focus based on my recommendation that we should, you know, of, of how we might allocate. And then those are reflected in the BCP that we work out with finance. Um, and I'll just add that while the initial 10 million um, allocation for our agency and statute covers our staffing as we grow or as we respond to additional obligations that are bestowed on us by the legislature, we do then have to go through the actual request process to request funding for those efforts or funding for additional staffing, et cetera. So um, just kind of high level, the budget is to reflect kind of the board's intent of the agency's kind of staffing goals and expenditures. Department of Finance oversees those. And then as Chair Urban said, um, once that is proposed, at that point, the, the, the board can provide input as to um, specific nuances if they care to. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. And thank you also for going, step, doing the step back, um, which is, of course, a very important step. So um, uh, my thinking for this coming fiscal year, for example, Mr. Thompson, would be to have on my list of agenda items for board meetings and to be sure to agendize again um, a discussion of the priorities um, for the coming fiscal year with Mr. Sultani. Um, and then we could also have um, an item once we see the more detailed budget that comes out of the governor's office before the legislature approves it. Um, if you would like, I don't really feel that strongly about it one way or the other, assuming that Mr. Sultani has translated our priorities appropriately, which I trust that he has, but we certainly could do that. And I think that would be, um, I think there's also a good argument that that's a, you know, a fair and useful um, uh, sort of regularized kind of oversight that the board could provide. Um, Mr. Thompson, I think this is probably on the same discussion. Um, and Ms. De La Torre, just like, you know, wave your hand if you're if I'm if I'm passing over you on this, okay, all right. Um, can we ask? Can I ask Mr. Thompson to respond, and then and then I'll go to Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, thank you for that explanation. That that's helpful. Um, I, I think it, it helps me to understand better. I don't know that it alleviates the concern that I feel about this, which is that. I, it's, I feel like the five board members are ultimately accountable for the operation of the agency and, and the budget is 
a critical, uh, a budget is an expression of priority. Um, and it's, a, as, as you mentioned, Chair Urban, it's a, it's a translation of our articulated priorities into dollars and, and, and initiatives. Um, under the process that was described, it's not, it would come back from the governor's office. We could then have some visibility and opine. Mm -hmm. Should we decide to change something, what would the mechanism be? Um, this I, I I do not know other than the legislature can kind of do what it wants. Um, so what I propose is that um, Mr. Sultana and I will work through the um, work through this question and look for um, the sort of points at which the board um, can give input that might change the budget um, in addition to in addition to the statement of priorities that we make at the outset that the that the that the staff translate into the budget. I will say I agree with you very much, Mr. Thompson, that the board is ultimately responsible um, for how the agency um, chooses to allocate its resources and spend its money. At the same time, there is a balance between the board being responsible in that way, setting priorities and taking care to provide oversight and being too involved in um, some of the, the the real sort of detail um, in a way that is perhaps less efficient and less helpful. So I do want to be sure that we are providing the guidance, providing the oversight, um, and making sure that we retain the ability to do that um, without necessarily bogging things down, um, you know, over detail. And I don't think that's what you are proposing, Mr. Thompson. I just want to be. Um, uh, I just want to clear. I just want to be clear that um, that we will need to be attentive to that. Yeah. Um, Ms. De La Torre, well, sorry, just to close that out. My understanding of what we're talking about is the agency is submitting to the governor's office a proposed budget. They may have feedback That's and say, "Oh, well, you should more here, less here." And there's a, a process that goes back and forth with the between the agency and the department to determine what is included in the governor's budget proposal to the legislature, which is then ultimately approved, uh, and perhaps modified at the legislature, and then signed into law. Um, I'm not suggesting that we're, we the board are involved in the puts and takes between mm -hmm. the Department of Finance and the agency, but what I am suggesting is that we should have visibility into what we're submitting and proposing to the governor's office so that we are aware of it prior to it, its submission. But the, the, the back and forth, I, I don't think it is, is necessary for us to be involved in. I do have a concern that, that we don't have visibility into what we're proposing to the governor's office. And I guess my question, perhaps for Mr. Souble or others, is, is there a mechanism that is Bagley Keen compliant for us to have visibility on the budget prior to proposing it to the governor's office? Uh, and how do other agencies that are governed by boards do that? So budget uh, budget change proposals are confidential until the governor publishes the budget. Um, and I would be happy to work with Mr. Souble um, to look into that. I will say, however, I do think that the board should trust the staff to translate our priorities um, into that early budget. I do support the idea of us having oversight before the legislature finally approves it, if that's what the board would like to do, but I want to see a balance here. Ms. De La Torre? I, I just wanted to quickly share on this point, um, and this is obviously California administrative process, I'm not very familiar with it, but I will strongly suggest that we look at the federal not the Federal, the Fair Political Practices Commission. We are structured in a way that's similar to that commission. And they have a very developed budget adoption and budget change process that is expressed in their policy. So I think it could be a good guidance in terms of finding the balance that uh, the chairperson Urban just mentioned. I'm happy to share that with um, the chair or other members if, if, um, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the document. And it's not necessary that we copy it, but I, I think there's a lot of value in seeing a very similar commission, how they have structured their, their process. Thank and it you. does, yes. it, it, it's very little. And 
I think it will be helpful. Thank you very much, just Ms. Delatory. And yes, we are to some degree modeled on that commission. Is that available on their website? Could you email it to Mr. Suble, perhaps, if you'd like? Yes. To? Okay. Thank yes. you. All right. I'm um, happy to do that. Okay, um, Mr. Suble, and then Ms. Sierra. Yes, I, I work with the executive director Sultani to come up with a recommendation for the board and how to handle that process. And we'll make sure that we're following what would be Bagley King compliant to meet with the desires of the board on how to go through that process. Thank you, Mr. Suble. Um, Ms. Sierra? Um, yes, thank you. Um, you know, from my perspective, um, I I am of the view that us giving as a board and each board member in our board meetings, being able to give the executive director and staff our general direction is the right balance and rely on them for then working out the details of then how to accomplish that within the budget that our agency has. Um, and to that end, I, I do like the idea, um, the chair's proposal that on future has a future agenda item, maybe we're just more specific that, you know, an opportunity for the board to give input for the direction of the agency for purposes of developing a future um, BCP. So that it's very clear that that discussion is on that issue. Um, because, you know, my understanding from my experience on the BCPs, you know, you go very granular, you know, it's basically if we have these priorities and how many people does it take, you know, for each area to fulfill that. And a lot of analysis goes into that, looking at maybe other agencies or past experience. And I think that to me is really the appropriate work of the staff in trying to balance and analyze all of that um, with, you know, following the board's more high level general direction of priorities. Um, so again, I think in, from my perspective, if we had an agenda that you know, we are talking about both priorities generally, but you know, very much with an eye toward future budgets, I think that would be helpful. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Sierra. Um, Mr. Sultani. Great. Thank you for those comments. I just wanted to urge the board if they haven't already to go and review the um, current BCP that's on the Department of Finance website. I think we've set that around a few months ago when it was um, approved, but if you haven't, I'd be happy to re-provide, resend that link to the board and they can review the kind of the level of granularity or you know um, specificity that exists in that BCP. For us as a startup agency, it's actually still pretty quite high level. It kind of reflects some of the background I provided in terms of our hiring priorities of which divisions we're hiring for, which we're not hiring for, which, you know, whether we're pursuing a telework or hybrid posture, whether, um, for example, what our approximate headcount and division counts will be, it's kind of at that level. So so would urge the board to kind of review that as a, as a foundational step as well, if they haven't already. Um, the other thing I just wanted to quickly respond to earlier comments, just um, wanted to also express my appreciation to the staff for the hiring. So I, I would appreciate all the public positive comments from the board, but we could have literally not done this without the amazing kind of HR staff, as you know, one of the core hires. Actually, in pre preparing this um, presentation, I went through and kind of mapped our monthly hires of how many people, and it was kind of like exponential growth after we hired our kind of critical HR team. And we also owe a lot of great deal of thanks to the VOJ and Brian, Brian himself has been instrumental in helping us through that process. So really like the, th the thanks should be on staff, not really me. So, but thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, I'd like to pause for a second and do some summary um, so that we know where we're headed with this discussion. Um, thank you again, Mr. Sultani for all the work and absolutely yes to the staff. As Ms. Sierra um, said, it is hard to hire folks. It is also a tight market and people have a lot of options. And you and um, Deputy Director of Administration Chidambira and the HR staff have put together a crackerjack team. And I know we really do appreciate it. Um, with regards to the budget process um, going forward, Mr. Thompson has voiced a desire um, for more um, opportunities for input into the process and oversight. Um, I think there's general support for that. Um, there is a desire for balance um, that I expressed and some others 
between the board's best role and the staff's best role. Um, I have on my list to regularize a meeting, um, and Mr. Sultani, you and I can work on the right timing for that meeting, I assume in the spring, but given the way the state government works, maybe we're going to have to move it up, I don't know, but we'll figure that out. Um, when we have a considered discussion of priorities, I'd like to highlight here that that will interact with the higher level strategic planning discussion that we will be working on. Um, but of course, then that would be an annual process, um, uh, an annual process. Uh, then um, Mr. Souble has um, said that he will look into um, uh, uh, the budget control, was it budget control? I always get it wrong. Okay, thank you. Change. Um, change. Budget change proposal um, process with regards to um, the 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 policy that that agencies do follow, which is that it is um, confidential until it's in the governor's budget. Um, and he will report um, to the board on that so that we have that information. Um, and either way, once we do have a public BCP, which at the, which is currently when it comes out of the governor's office, but before the legislature makes decisions, um, I have on my list to tentatively um, now schedule again a board discussion so that we have the opportunity to provide um, some oversight looking at the detail if we would like before the legislature makes its decision. And I also have on my list um, uh, for everyone, um, but certainly for Mr. Suble and Ms. Sultani as they work to advise us on this, um, to look at the Fair Political Practices Commission's process, which as with so many of their things, Ms. De La Torre points out as well, thought out so we can use that as a source. Have I missed anything? Mr. Thompson. I, I have one specific question because what, what I understand is the, the intersection of these processes and badly keen to be is that through this process, the agency's proposed budget is unavailable to the board until it is available to the public, which strikes me as a pretty odd outcome. And if, if that is correct, I'd like to understand that that's correct or what the other options are. Um, Cause that, that just, that, uh, that is just a, is a perverse intersection of these, of these uh, policies in my opinion. Yes, so thank you, Mr. Thompson. And that is the way Bagley Keen works generally. If the board knows it, the public knows it. Um, the public always has an interest in, in what, the, what the board as a group knows. Um, I'm glad that you um, mentioned that um, and it, it, is, it is noted um, as, as a view. And I know Mr. Soublay, I know will be, will be looking into that. Um, uh, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, I was going to move to the separate topic that I had raised at the beginning. I don't know if we're ready for that. Um, you're, re you're ready. Okay. Um, I do think we are ready to circle back, but I want to be sure Mr. Thompson is able to finish his thoughts. Mr. Thompson? I just wanted to make sure that I, I heard you say that the view was noted. I wanted to ensure that the question was going to be answered in specific rather than in abstract. Oh, of um, course. Okay. okay. Yes. It, and Mr. Thompson, that's part of the analysis that I'll work with Mr. Uh, Sultani on. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sublay. Appreciate it. And I apologize if that wasn't clear what I meant. I meant that that is a specific item that is on the list of things that are going into the analysis. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All right. I think now we are ready to circle back to Ms. De La Torre. Um, please go ahead, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. I'm going to try to be brief. I want to talk a little bit about our per diem for a second. And the reason I'm bringing up uh, the per diem in this context is because through the process, the budget process, um, the agency can request from the governor's office a change to the per diem. A request doesn't mean that it will be granted. Okay, Ms. De La Torre, I apologize. I just put, can you hold your thought for just a second? I do need to ask Mr. Souble if this is in line. We have a pretty general discussion update of the budget. Is this something that we can talk about or do we need to agendize this? I think, I, the, 
I think we need to agendize this as an issue for the board because we're talking about the current budget and that's what the update was. I don't think the public has been noticed that we would have a discussion on a change to what is the per diem set by statute. So if we're gonna have a discussion about that, I think it's consistent with Bagley Keene that we have to have that as an agenda item that's noticed for public participation. So okay. I, um, I brought this up to the attention of the executive director. So I'm surprised that it's not agendized in a way that enables that conversation. But if that's the position of the um, you know, council, I guess we'll just have to move it to a different day. So Ms. De La Torre, um, please be sure to bring this up uh, for future agenda items and I will put it on the list so that we have, it's properly agendized and we can discuss it. Um, right, so yeah. what, I mean, in, in this case, if I have a conversation with the executive director and I was told that this will be the item to bring it in, maybe we miscommunicated internally um, about how we agendize things. Yep. Um, what would be the correct process for me to bring it up? Because I just, uh, you so know, I, tend, I tend to have this conversation with the executive director just because of back leaking and just not, you know, be in a situation where we might inadvertently, you know, violate it because of talking to one board member as opposed yeah. to the executive director. So where do I bring this request if not to the executive director? Okay, um, so uh, we will have, we do have our agenda item number nine today for future agenda items. Please bring it up, note it down on my list. You can also always send um, proposed agenda items um, to staff um, or I, and I will check with Mr. Souble. Generally, you can send them to me as well. Um, so long as it doesn't involve any information that would be a sharing of information outside Bagley King. Um, and then, um, then it gets on to the agenda that's noticed properly 10 days prior to the meeting so that the public has notice of what we're going to discuss. Um, so um, let's be sure to talk about this under agenda item number nine. Um, and that's really all I think we can say about it right now, um, but we can agendize it um, for a meeting coming up soon. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. Sultani. And my apologies, Ms. Tillatore, I, I believe we had that conversation after we had already posted the agenda for this uh, board meeting. And so that's why I suggested to perhaps suggest that as a future board meeting, um, it was past the 10 day, if I recall cor correctly, but uh, my apologies if there was a miscommunication there. Okay, so um, so we'll talk about that on agenda item number nine, which would be a, pro a proper and appropriate. Um, and this is just a matter of, of timing and making sure the public has notice. All right, thank you everyone. Um, any further discussion um, on this item? Okay, I appreciate very much the board's um, thoughtful comments, um, both on the uh, budget and the work that the executive director and staff are doing and also on process oversight, um, moving how we move forward um, in terms of, of budget um, understanding, setting priorities and oversight. Thank you um, all to that. Um, I think we have information that will help the staff um, develop um, some advice and a plan and for me um, to, to also sort of think through what is a good process going forward. Um, are there any comments from the public? Please raise your hand if you have a comment. I see no hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, thank you again very much to the board. Um, thank you to the public for your attention and participation thus far. We are now moving to agenda item number four, which is a closed session discussion of two sub items. First, the executive director's appointment of a general counsel under authority of government code 11126 subdivision A subdivision one, and also the executive director's annual review, also under authority of government code 11126 subdivision A <coughs> division one. 
Um, before the board departs for its closed session discussion, um, is there any public comment on either of these topics? Please raise your hand if you have a comment. Use the raise hand feature in Zoom. I'll give it one minute. I see no hands raised. All right, thank you very much. Um, the board will now go into closed session. The public session here will be remain open and we will return to this public session when we are finished. Um, thank you very much for attending today. And I will ask board members to please now move to the Zoom meeting established for the closed session discussion for this agenda item. Thank you very much. See you soon. All right, Mr. Sultani, shall I invite everyone back? Yes, that'd be great. I think we're ready. Okay. Ms. De La Torre, are you ready to begin? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone um, for attending today. This meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now returning from closed session. Uh, the board did not take any votes or actions during the closed session. Um, with thanks for the efficient discussion so far and to continue in that vein, I would say efficient yet substantive discussion so far, and to continue um, in that vein, I'm going to go ahead and take the next item out of order uh, and move to what is listed on the agenda as number seven, the delegation of authority for administrative functions. That way we will handle our administrative items and give the subcommittee some comfortable time for their updates. So um, with that, let me scroll to the delegation. Um, so I ask you to please direct your attention to agenda item number seven, which is discussion of a limited delegation of authority for administrative functions to the executive director. As a reminder, section 1798.199.35 of our implementing statute states that the agency board may delegate authority to the chairperson or the executive director to act in the name of the agency between meetings of the agency, except with resolution to of enforcement actions and rulemaking authority. Prior to the board appointing Mr. Sultani as executive director, it delegated day-to-day -day authority, that is the authority to do things to set up the agency and operate it on a day-to-day -day basis to the chairperson. The board transferred that authority to Mr. Sultani when he became executive director under a delegation that lasted for one year. Believe it or not, it is going to be a year on October 18th. Um, we talked a little bit about this under the budget item, but um, I think we are all very impressed with what the executive director has accomplished in that year. Um, but in any case, it is now time to consider and renew the executive director's delegation. So I'd ask you to please turn your attention to the proposed delegation of authority in the meeting materials. It's designated in its file name as for item seven under the meeting materials for today. Um, and I do wanna just cover some background before we begin discussion, um, just in case um, there's any information that slipped from people's minds. First, this proposed delegation is the same as the delegation the executive director is currently operating under. It gives him essentially the day-to-day -day administrative authority that he needs to continue building and running the agency. Second, 
Please note that the delegation does not cover the specific rulemaking functions that the executive director, director will need to be able to execute for our current rulemaking process. We separately direct, delegated the authority for the agency um, uh, to take the steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process and the public comment period, and set the matter for a hearing uh, when we met in June. And we will need to separately delegate authority to submit the final rulemaking package later after we have approved it. Um, third, as you may recall, or you may not, um, because it has been a while, um, in the October 18th, 2021 board meeting, the board voted to delegate authority for day-to-day -day operations to the executive director, with the exception of hiring the chief privacy auditor, as you see here. The board also at that time agreed to place the delegation of authority on its November 15th, 2021 agenda for discussion, and indeed took that discussion up in its November 15, 2021 meeting. This is because the majority board view was that the delegation should extend to all positions other than the chief privacy auditor, which is designated in our implementing statute as a position to be appoint appointed by the board. In a minority view, however, some members of the board thought there should be further board input into some executive positions. Mr. Thompson, in particular, explained his view that we are a new agency, and thus certain executive positions could affect how the agency's culture develops. After discussion in its November 15th, 2021 meeting, the board found consensus around Mr. Thompson's idea in the form of board input via properly noticed closed session discussions for the general counsel and deputy director of communications positions. The chief auditor does remain within the board's direct responsibility and authority. Accordingly, this is how we have proceeded um, as our meeting agendas show. I appreciate the board's careful attention and balanced approach. My recommendation is that we continue with it. Accordingly, I recommend that we approve the delegation provided for today's discussion, that it again be for one year, and that we maintain the expectation regarding input on the general counsel and deputy director of communications positions. Procedurally, this is a vote on the delegation. There's no need to vote on the consensus expectation of input. The executive director will, as he has thus far, coordinate appropriate meetings to receive board input. Mm -hmm. um, we can vote on that if you really want to, but it isn't necessary. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Okay, thank you. you. Need a motion? I'm sorry. You need a motion. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I will need a motion. Um, before I, we get to the motion, though, I will ask if there is public comment. Please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment using the Zoom's raise hand feature. I don't see any hands raised. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I believe you're up. May I have a motion to approve the delegation of authority before us? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. The motion has been made by Mr. Thompson and seconded, seconded by Ms. De La Torre. The board will now vote whether to approve the motion. Mr. Sible, could you please perform the roll call vote? You're on mute. <laughs> Ms. Delatore. Aye. Mr. Lay. Aye. Mr. Thompson. Aye. Ms. Sierra. Aye. Ms. Urban. Aye. If a 5 0 vote, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Suble. The motion has been approved by the vote of five to zero. I thank the board for its very efficient disposition of this item and the approved delegation of authority will be posted to the CPPA's website um, along with the other meeting materials. Thanks again um, for the work on that. Um, and now let's go um, and return to agenda item number five so that we can have discussion of the more substantive uh, material from our subcommittees. As a brief reminder, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act allows for subcommittees of two people to act in an advisory capacity for the board. Subcommittees cannot make decisions for the board and have defined jurisdictions in order to ensure that Bagley Keene's transparency requirements remain in place. 
The Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee was formed to advise the board on the agency's duties to promote public awareness and provide guidance to consumers and businesses, as set out in Civil Code Section 1798.199.40D through F. The Public Awareness and Guidance Subcommittee is made up of Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson. Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson, I'm eager to hear your update, and we'll turn things over to you now. Thank you. Um, I'll kick it off and give a brief update and then turn it over to, to Mr. Lay to continue. We've got a couple of items to update the board and the public on. Um, you may recall that we mentioned at our last meeting that um, we had contracted, the agency had contracted with uh, an outside firm to help with our public awareness and education responsibilities. The, the statute that created the agency uh, spells out that one of our key areas of responsibility is to promote, quote, quote, promote public awareness and understanding, end quote, of privacy. Uh, so in, in August, we undertook our first public awareness campaign, which we rolled out in advance of the rulemaking hearings last month. Um, the, the awareness campaign was a two-week mixed terrestrial radio and streaming audio campaign. Uh, which was designed to raise awareness about the agency's mission and to encourage participation in our first rulemaking hearings, uh, which occurred at the end of August. Um, for background, the, the campaign was non-targeted, uh, which means that we didn't specify a particular audience or use personal information to target individuals, which we be believed was the best way to reach the, a broad audience across the state while aligning with our philosophy uh, as an agency. So the use of both terrestrial radio and streaming audio helped us ensure that we reached California residents in every part of the state. And the, the radio and banner ads um, were in both English and Spanish. And we're looking forward to expanding the languages uh, that we provide material and educational material in, in, in future efforts. All in all, this. I think that the campaign was a big success uh, and, and the feedback from the firm was that uh, it resulted in approximately 112 million impressions across the state on popular radio podcasts and NPR stations. I heard it um, on, on popular radio stations in Southern California and, and I believe and hope others heard it as well. Um, and perhaps related to that outreach effort, we did have substantial participation in the rulemaking comment process, and we've received over 100 comments to the agency and traffic to the website that increased approximately 300% uh, in this period as well. Um, Mr. Soltani has queued up uh, a sample of the English radio spot, uh, which I think is probably beneficial for folks to hear if they weren't able to, to hear the spots. Um, so for, for both the board and the public, uh, it's a 30 second spot that um, we can queue up and share with folks. Mr. Soltani, are you prepared to do that? Sure thing. Let me, um, I might pause it to just get the volumes right, but let's try that. Okay. When you use the internet, you automatically share personal information that can be used to discriminate against you or charge you more for a product. Fortunately, the California Privacy Protection Agency is making new rules to let you better control your online privacy. For example, Californians have the right to ask businesses to stop selling their information or even delete it altogether. But that's not all. Visit cppa.ca.gov to learn more about your privacy rights and how to participate in our public hearings later this month. Thank you. Uh, so straightforward and effective. Um, and as mentioned, you know, uh, there was a, a big increase in traffic to the web website. Uh, can't be positive that's attributable to the campaign, but it, it, makes, it makes sense that it would be related. Um, on a separate item, um, Moving forward, the, the agency and, and Mr. Soltani are in the process of hiring our Deputy Director of Public Affairs, um, which is a position that's advertised on, on the agency's website and is open until the end of this month. And then once that person is on board, 
um, where we are looking at exploring additional awareness and education campaigns in support of the mandate in, in the statute, and really to help Californians understand the rights that they have and the, the risks and responsibilities related to collection and use of personal information. Um, and so we will have a, a further update on additional um, mechanisms and partnerships we can use for that purpose. I will, I'll pause there and, and turn it over to Mr. Lake. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, and you know, in <clears throat> while we were driving people to the website with those, um, you know, those ads, we also made some updates. So, um, you know, we updated and expanded on the frequently asked questions, um, you know, something that we've heard, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of questions from stakeholders. So that was part of that response. Um, this includes basics like describing the rights provided by the CC CCPA, the rulemaking process, and how to best engage with the agency uh, for rulemaking. Um, we also attempted to answer questions we think will inform stakeholders, particularly small businesses, and you've heard a lot from them, um, by reiterating the threshold for what constitutes a business under the Act. You know, just to reiterate what's on the website, you know, to qualify as a business under the law, uh, CCPA specifies that for-profit entities must meet one of three thresholds, you know, that's a gross annual revenue of over $25 million by receiving or selling the personal information of more than 50,000 uh, 50, or more California residents, households or devices, or derive 50% more or more of their annual revenue from selling California residents' personal information. These thresholds will change beginning on January 1st, 2023. Uh, for example, starting in 2023, to meet the second threshold, businesses must annually buy, sell, or share personal information of 100,000 or more consumers or households. Um, you know, in also in response to those questions, we also outlined that uh, as the CCPA is currently only enforced by the California Department of Justice until July 1st, 2023, consumer complaints should currently be directed to the DOJ's uh, the Department of Justice online via their consumer privacy interactive tool. After that, July 1st, 2023, uh, consumer complaints may be directed to the agency. Agency may decide not to investigate a complaint or decide to provide a business with time to cure the alleged violation by considering um, factors such as the lack of intent to violate this title, voluntary efforts taken by the business, service provider or contractor uh, or person, um, and you know to cure the alleged violation prior to being notified by the agency of the complaint. And you know, I know we have received many comments uh, to allow businesses additional time to comply with regulations once they are finalized. We are somewhat limited in what we can say in this regard, but perhaps the agency can request from the legislature the ability to provide more direct guidance to businesses uh, and respond to those um, businesses that may mistakenly think that they're impacted uh, by the CCPA without running afoul of our underground rulemaking rules. Um, alternative, alternatively, the agency could consider promulgating a regulation expressly recognizing that a delay in finalizing, finalizing the regulations is a factor that the agency may consider when deciding whether to initiate an enforcement action or provide businesses with a time period to cure the alleged violation. So I hope this answers some of the questions that we've been getting from uh, from the public and other stakeholders. Um, and you know that's pretty much the end of my my comments. You know we'd be happy to answer any outstanding questions around the website, the FAQ, uh, and perhaps gather some feedback from you all on um, what what to do next. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Lay. I was really excited to hear that ad. <laughs> I heard it in both English and Spanish and I was delighted. Um, and I do, it does sound like um, it reached people in California so that they know that the agency is here um, to be a support um, for both consumers and businesses. Thank you very much for your work on that. Um, also the FAQs I think are very helpful um, and thank you for that. Um, so I'm just excited um, by the work that you're doing um, and look forward to continuing to hear how it is going. Um, I want to have make just one little process comment, which I really also appreciate the update 
um, as to how the public awareness subcommittee is thinking about um, providing information to the public and to consumers and businesses in line with our legal um, our legal limitations and parameters. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I just wanna remind the board that as we discuss this, we will need to remain um, talking only about the public awareness and guidance subcommittee's efforts and not drift into um, uh, topics that are um, really about rulemaking or um, or requests to the legislature directly. Um, so thank you both very much for the update. I think this is tremendously exciting. Um, I hope that it's been helpful so far for the public. Um, and um, I am looking forward to hearing from Ms. De La Torre and then Ms. Sierra. Thank you, Mrs. Herbert. Um, I'm hoping that I won't drift away <laughs> from the topic again. But um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, first of all, I echo the words of um, Mrs. Servan. Thank you for the work that has been done. I think this is a fantastic initiative and it's a main core um, uh, goal of our agency to increase awareness around privacy in the state of California. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to go back to is something that Mr. Lee mentioned, which is this need for guidance. And when we look at how other data protection authorities or privacy authorities here in the US have been able to really educate the public, um, then there might be an expectation that we will be able to do something similar. And um, I would love to see us do something similar, particularly with a small business, you know, issue guidelines to help them in a kind of checklist way, understand what are the steps that they have to take as opposed to having to read all our rules. Um, so I guess my question is, absent possibly um, a change in the statute that will enable the agency to be more um, proactive with guidelines, is are there other paths? And, and perhaps if, Mr. Sherman doesn't mind. Um, we are very aware of these limitations that we have in the agency in terms of underground rules, but I'm not sure that the public at large is aware. So I, I'm not, I think there would be value in trying to maybe um, ask our you know, counsel or maybe uh, yourself to kind of explain to the public what are those limitations just for the pub purpose of them having a better understanding. So I will um, ask Mr. Soublay to interrupt us both if we are drifting too far. Um, so far, I think this is directly related to the public awareness subcommittee's work and what they have reported. And what I would suggest is that we return to this topic after Ms. Sierra's comment or question to see if it's something that the public awareness subcommittee um, has in its list of things that it is considering, and if not, um, if they would be sure to be considering that as part of their overall ambit um, of, of, of um, supporting public awareness and guidance. Um, Ms. Sierra? Yes, thank you. Um, so I was very excited also. I heard the public awareness campaign and the pieces, I heard them on the radio twice and just thought they were really terrific. I just feel like it was a great high level. It was just the right amount of information in my view to really um, reach a very broad audience. There are some people who are following us, many people following us, many businesses and consumers, but then there are others that this is still really a new, a, a new agency and a very new issue to them. So I thought it provided really great information for both in a way really inviting people to understand we really want them involved. So thank you very much. I, I just thought they were terrific. And I really like the fact that, again, while it might not be you know, totally precise that you, know, you are looking at metrics generally to see you know, uptick in um, people, you know, both businesses and consumers providing comment and looking at our website. I think that's really helpful um, information for all of us in the agency. Um, with respect to you know, what we can do, 
Um, again, I think we're all for, we want to give as much guidance as we can and the statute wants us to. I really think the FAQs working on those and modifying or adding to those um, is very helpful. So thank you. Um, and particularly as um, Mr. Lay mentioned, we've heard so much from small businesses that addressing um, this, that issue in terms of who is covered, I think is very important. So thank you. Um, and finally, with respect to the proposal so that um, we do have the ability to provide maybe additional guidance. You know, it seems both of the proposals that are on the table that you've mentioned kind of could go hand in hand. And, I'm sorry, Ms. Yeah, I just said there are proposals on the table and oh. that would be that would be out, out of line. But that but Mr. Lee did mention a couple of things that mm -hmm. have come up. Okay. Well, in terms of just the items mentioned, to me those are very interesting and um I could see that they could be helpful, you know, to our mission. Thank and you, Ms. Sierra. Um, so if, so thank you um, all, um, and thank you, Ms. De La Torre and Ms. Sierra for your comments. Um, with regards to what I think Mr. Thompson and Mr. Lay, you're hearing is interest from the rest of the board with regards to the form that guidance can take and the parameters around that guidance. We also have to take, we have to take into account like how much we're piling on you. We also have to take into account jurisdictional boundaries under Bagley Keene so that you're also not drifting into rulemaking or legislative work. So here's what I would suggest and feel free to tell me, you know, you've got enough on your plate. But what I suggest is that if you can as you did this time, um, let us know when you find that you're running into those limitations. Um, and we here as a group can also all, you know, make staff aware that we are attentive to these issues um, and that the public awareness subcommittee will be reporting on sort of examples of when it's running into the issues. And then maybe staff can advise us on approaches and if we need subcommittees to work on those approaches we can do that or if we just take advice from staff we can we can do that um, i'm trying to balance here um, what we can do under the agenda making sure that we have subcommittees with appropriately limited jurisdictions under bagley king and um, also not ask mr thompson and mr lay to take on the world at least yet yeah um I, I'm not quite sure yet exactly how, yeah, how to present this, you know, these ideas. Um, yeah, they're not proposed, not formal proposals uh, as of yet. These are just some things that would help the public awareness and guidance subcommittee uh, provide some more public awareness around the issues that we've been hearing. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll talk with staff on the best way to to bring that forward in a more formal uh, manner and and make that assigned to the proper subcommittee or. Um, uh, body of the 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 board, so um, that's that's fine with me. Um, and there's one other thing, not not to get off the 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 topic, but some input we would like from the board would be around um, what are what is kind of the the feeling around uh, targeted advertising. If that is something we would do to reach out to groups that may not normally be reached by you know our our untargeted campaign, um, does the board have strong feelings one way or the other about it. Um, and beyond that, we have, you know, a, a new hire coming in around um, that would take over, kind of lead a lot of the work that uh, Mr. Thompson and I are, are doing. So we really take advice from them, but any high level thoughts on, you know, perhaps areas for the next campaign uh, to possibly focus on, such as, you know, partnering with community organizations, things like that, so that we could provide some input for, um, you know, our, the new hire. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Thompson, did you have additional comments before? I don't, Mr. Okay. Lay covered okay. it well. Yeah, and, and thank you for the question. Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. Um, I am going to provide my personal answer to the question that Mr. Lay asked in terms of targeted advertising. My personal opinion is that even though CCPA does not really apply to the public sector, we as an agency should strive to abide by the same principles that we are um, enforcing. So every campaign that is put out that has to do with um, awareness or 
any other thing. And even thinking about how we deal with the personal data of our employees, which we also regulate in the private sector, I think our aim should be to be compliant with CCPA as if it was imposed on us as an agency, even though we know we are a public agency and that's not the case. Yeah, I'm not saying the the the, the targeted advertising would be non-compliant with CCPA. Um, as far as CCPA goes, you know, we would, you know, follow, follow all those rules, I would imagine. Um, but, you know, within the bounds of CCPA, is there a kind of a feeling among the board that we shouldn't do any targeted advertising at all, even if it is compliant? Not on my side. On my side, my belief is that so long as we comply with the rules that we are imposing on others, we should take advantage of the tools that we have to reach the audience that we need to reach. Thank you, Ms. Delatroy. I will say I have some confusion around what is meant by targeted advertising um, because I have a different reaction to um, advertising that is sort of generally demographic in nature um, versus advertising more um, targeted in, in more detail. Uh, I agree with Ms. Delatroy that the statute is absolutely a guide, and it sounds like that wasn't a question in the subcommittee's mind at all. Um, but it might be that it's a little difficult to answer the question without some specifics. Um, I absolutely think that there are some trade-offs between um, making sure that we aren't um, using personal information in a way that is outside um, what we think is appropriate while also doing our very best to um, engage in outreach that will reach all California communities, not just some California communities. And I know that's the goal of the subcommittee as, as well. Um, Mr. Sultani? Just a logistical issue. I saw that Ms. Delatore uh, uh, drop oh, off. Oh, she, she, did, she did drop off. So Sorry, I did not actually. Yeah, I, I, you uh, came on. She went off. You came on, and I had the same number of boxes. Um, no problem. Uh, Miss Sierra, also, I apologize. Um, did I miss your hand? Uh, no, no, but okay. um, yeah. Okay, um, Ms. De, De La Torre, um, apologies. I didn't initially notice that you had dropped away. I was simply agreeing that um, follow the statute is a good guide um, and saying that what targeted advertising means um, will be important and that I saw a balance between making sure that we're not using personal information in ways that we don't consider appropriate and making sure that we do reach all California communities. So what I would suggest is that um, if Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson, you think that you have enough information from the board to keep um, moving forward, um, that we, um, you know, ask you to work with staff with this sort of general guidance in place and let us know if there's anything that you need us to decide. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Let me ask one clarifying question. Um, so I, thought, I think this has been a helpful discussion of this topic. Um, what I heard, as in part playing it back to make sure it's understood, is one threshold is that we should operate as though the statute and the regulations apply to us. Mm -hmm. um, another standard would be that we should op we should hold ourselves to a higher standard than the statute or the regulations, that would need to be defined uh, what, what that higher standard would be. Um, and so I think those were kind of, those were the increments that, that we were trying to get our heads around where, where board colleagues were as far as um, the use of, of personal information or other data to target messaging or advertising. Um, so. I, what I think I'm hearing is we should apply, we should certainly at a minimum, I don't, want to, I don't want to misphrase, but at a minimum, we should operate as though the statute and the regulations apply to us. Is that? I, I think, I, I think, yes, I think we also would need to understand the, the legal implications. And if that works, I don't mean in the sense that we are protecting privacy at the same level, but that we are a government agency. Um, we are not selling data, um, for example. Um, so I also 
again, I just find it a little difficult to, without some kind of metric or some kind of example to, to say exactly um, what I think. Um, what I do think is that if you're asking the question, I think you're being attentive to it. And um, that it would be that I would um, ask you to work with staff who have expertise and understand, I hope from this discussion, the questions that the board has. And if there is something that seems as though there is um, that there are trade-offs um, and staff are not sure that we have the opportunity to discuss that um, in, in, in a board meeting. Ms. De La Torre? I'm just trying to get clarity on, on the guidance that we're giving to the staff committee as well. Um, so again, from my perspective, we obviously should act as if the um, CCP applied to us, but beyond that, if there is no ability, and I don't think there is any ability to you know, provide very concrete guide, guidelines, my inclination will be to actually leave it to the subcommittee to make the decision, right? So, so long as you're confident that we are operating within the boundaries of the statute, which I'm sure you will be based on the advice of our staff, um, then if there is a situation where you might consider, um, you know, it, this is within the boundaries, but we don't feel comfortable doing it, or this is within the boundaries, but we prefer not to do it. Uh, I think that the best practical way to deal with it will be to leave it to the subcommittee to decide. Um, because I don't know that as a board, um, having that discussion will have an impact other than potentially delaying the, the campaigns. And I really trust Mr. Lee and Mr. Thompson to make the right choice in that context if that's um, agreeable with the rest of the board. Uh, I do have to make an addendum, which is that we've delegated authority to the executive director. Subcommittees do not have decision-making authority or they are no longer subcommittees. But I think that the subcommittee has heard guidance from the board and can work with the staff with the proper delegated authority and can have the judgment to decide if there is something that um, staff and the subcommittee think really requires more guidance from the board. Um, there are nodding think, heads. Yeah, I think that's right. It was a philosophical question. More, I, I appreciate your point, uh, Chair, that it's hard to get get more detailed feedback in the hypothetical rather than an, an actual example. But I think the the philosophical guidance that was provided is 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 what we needed. So thank you. I would that. I would add one more suggestion, which is. Um, if there is something that is on that sort of in the gray area where um, Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson um, and um, you know Mr. Sultani and the Deputy Director of Public Affairs when they arrive um, thinks they're not certain, uh, the statute also very clearly lays out purposes and values uh, that um, are behind the specific legal requirements. And so that also will probably provide guidance and then if you if you want, if you if you think that the board's guidance is necessary, I just encourage you to come back. I agree with Ms. De La Torre. You know, we don't want to like work out every single campaign um, here in this meeting. That's not an efficient use of anyone's time. Um, but if in your judgment you think that there's a question, then just request an agenda item and we can talk about it. Great. I'd like to take public comment now. We have, uh, if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature. Um, we have- Okay, well, we actually, before before we take the first public comment, I do want to also add an addendum to my gratitude um, uh, to, the, to uh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Lay, Mr. Sultani, um, and uh, the staff who I know worked on this. Um, it's not a trivial thing um, to do a campaign like this. And I- Realize that you have um, a consultancy to help. So thanks to them and thanks to all the staff who have worked on this. Um, and I look forward to public comments. Great. We have uh, Medina. Medina, I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself. And they actually lowered their hand. So um, uh, we'll move on. Medina, if you want to. Make a comment, please uh, use the raise hand feature. 
We have uh, Reem, uh, Mr. Chahade. I apologize for butchering your name, Mr. Chahade. Uh, Mr. Yep. Chahade, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes starting now. Okay, thank you. Um, this is more of a question and I know you guys might not be able to answer, but when Mr. Lay mentioned uh, regulations um, for businesses and how it might be a problem since there is no official guidance out. Um, I was just wondering what the like final stance on that was. I know there's, you mentioned there's no official proposal, but um, it just got a little confusing towards the end. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, generally we cannot respond in detail. Um, there is a process question in there, which I'm happy to respond to which is that if we were to consider, for example, um, rules, that would be um, something that should be considered as a separate notice discussion. Um, but I think that Mr. Lay, who can correct me if I'm wrong, was indicating that the Public Awareness Subcommittee is aware of questions. Um, and thank you for the comment. If there are any commenters, uh, please uh, raise your hand. We have one other commenter. Mr. Chappelle, uh, Mr. Chappelle, you have, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, to share some thoughts. I, I, I've been listening intently to the discussion about the, the advertising campaign to promote public awareness. And in my view, it sounds like that might be a very good opportunity for the CPPA uh, to, to provide some insight, tell the community exactly how, how you advertised to what tools you used, uh, if it included targeted advertising, because th there's a there's a number of us as as you might expect who are, uh, you know, trying to work our way through the guidance document and understand how we might uh, engage in advertising campaigns, and so uh, that type of insight I think would be invaluable to the community, and I'm just curious. Uh, what the uh, what the board's thoughts are on that, and even if you'd be in position to to commit to providing that uh, that type of information to the community. Thank you very much, Mr. Chappelle. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chappelle. If there are any other comments, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise uh, raise hand feature. We'll just give it a minute. Um, Ms. Chahade again. Uh, Thank you. Um, so I see on the agenda that with the public comments, you're allowed to play, you're allowed to decide whether to place matters on the agenda for a future meeting. So I was just wondering if the issue of regulations and guidance for businesses to um, be able to follow these rules before January 1st will be something that will be decided for a future agenda. Thank you, Ms. Shahadi. Those um, items are, those items can be suggested under the appropriate agenda item, which I think is number nine today. Um, so if you want to suggest that item under agenda item number nine, um, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Great. If there are any other comments, uh, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature. Give me one minute. I see none. I'm no. sorry, Mr. Sultani. I see none or I see one. Sorry, I see none. I see no further comments. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sultani, um, and to everyone who commented, um, and to the Public Awareness Subcommittee um, for this exciting update and for the work. We will now move to agenda item number six, which is our second advisory subcommittee report um, with a proposed course of action from the rulemaking process subcommittee. Um, the rulemaking process subcommittee is one of three separate subject matter-based subcommittees formed to advise the board on the agency's rulemaking. 
The others are the update of CCPA rules subcommittee and the new CPRA, as in California Privacy Rights Act rules subcommittee. Uh, the rulemaking process subcommittee is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. I will now turn things over to them. And Mr. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, I'm hoping you can go through your entire proposal here, and then we will discuss it the way that Mr. Thompson and Mr. Lay gave their whole report. Um, but of course, just let us know if that's not going to work. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Irvin. Uh, will it be possible to project the slides? Mr. Sultani? Yes, you should be able to share screen. If not, let me know. Could you project it on your end? Oh, you'd like me to share? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't prepared to give me one minute. Uh, and I will um, get that set up. I thought uh, you meant if you were going to project the slides. Uh, one moment. Please. I appreciate it. Um, and just have lots of settings here. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, you know, I can, I do worry that as I'm also moderating, it might be, um, it might be a challenge. Um, let's give it a go and I'll see if, uh, Vincent, do you mind? Looks like you. I, I can, I can, <clears throat> I can project it. Just give me a second to pull it up. Yeah, I just wonder with, um, I think, well, let me, let me go ahead and try. I just worry that I, if I have any technical glitches, I can't attend to them. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, I think it should work. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I could also do it, but I don't, I don't have them open because I heard they were going to be projected, but I can open them if, need, if I need to. Yeah, let me see. It doesn't look normal. There's like a big, um, well, oh, I just got to grant access. Sorry, I can do that. Okay. I I would have to quit and reopen Zoom. Um, well, no. <laughs> if, that's, if that's fine, I can I can quit and rejoin. That's that's not an issue. Um, let me try. <laughs> but I need a second because I have to open them. Give me. This feels like a race. I've got them open. I can go ahead and inject them if you'd like. You have them. Please do. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Excellent. Can you see that? We have a winner. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Dale Torrey, if you just want to tell me when you'd like the slide advanced, I'll do that. This advance to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, so this slide, it just represents overall the process that we proposed in the prior meeting where um, the process of committee presented an update to the board. It's not the new slide. We just thought it would be a good way to start this presentation to remind the board and the public of the process that we are going to follow. There is really good information on our process on the website, by the way. So if you're a member of the public and you want to understand it a little better, I will definitely encourage you to look into that. Our process is very similar uh, to the process uh, that was followed by the California Attorney General with the difference that because we are a board, we do have to bring these um, different uh, proposals for changes uh, in the rules up to the uh, board for consideration and discussion. Um, if there are no questions about this slide, maybe we can move to the next one. During the uh, formal rulemaking period, we just wanted to remind the board of a few things. Um, and this uh, slide in particular refers to the administrative process 
requirements regarding comments under California law. Currently, the staff is reviewing all of the public comments that were received, both written and oral, and these were submitted during the 45 mandatory 45 day public comment period. It's important to note that even untimely comments, meaning comments that might be submitted after the 45 day um, period in this case, should be and will be included in the rulemaking file. The difference is that the agency might not be or will not be required to provide a response to those comments. And the reason we are bringing this to the attention of the board is because if um, any board member were to receive a comment or an email that includes a comment during this uh, period, even though we're outside of the 45 days, it's really important for us to send those comments to the executive director so that they can be properly um, classified and included in the rulemaking file. And then the agency will make a determination as to whether there is a response required or not. But on our end, as board members, we still should proactively bring to the attention of the executive director any comment that we might receive um, outside of the public comment period. Um, once we, um, you know, the, the agency has uh, reviewed these comments and changes to the rulemakings are proposed, uh, there will be uh, a meeting and, and like it was um, explained in the prior um, slide and we will have a new uh, public comment period that will be noticed. Um, we could move to the next slide maybe, thank you. Um, this last slide that I'm going to present uh, before I uh, turn it over to Mr. Thompson uh, relates to um, the role of the subcommittees after the formal rulemaking period opens. And um, we, as um, we have mentioned in the past, we're trying to generate a process that is not only applicable to this particular rulemaking process, but just the way we're going to function moving forward for rulemaking. But in this particular rulemaking process that we are in, this really applies to the uh, CCPA update, uh, rules update subcommittee. That's a subcommittee that generated the uh, draft of rules that are now uh, going through the formal process. So our understanding based on the prior conversations that we have had with the board is that these um, subcommittees during the a formal rulemaking period um, will be dormant, not dissolved. So we're not dissolved with this subcommittee, but uh, it shouldn't be actively meeting on a regular basis. However, the expectation is that the subcommittee will be available to staff as needed for historical memory. So it could be there could be situations where either the executive director or a member of the staff might reach to the members of the uh, CCPA rules update subcommittee in this case and ask for a meeting for a particular purpose. It's not expected that the, those subcommittees will review proposed revisions, meaning when the staff comes um, to us with the edits to the rules that have been published, they will come to us as a board. They will not go to the subcommittee for comments on the edits. Um, and that's the last point that the staff will propose those revisions to the board. And I'm going to pause here for a second, Mrs. Urban, just to give an opportunity to other board members to um, confirm that this understanding that we derive from prior meetings is correct and aligns with, um, with, the, with their understanding. Um, could you kindly see if there are any hands Thank raised, you. any board member that might have comments on this? Thank you, Ms. Desiree. For my own part, I think I need to hear the whole process to really understand how it all fits together. I can say this is not exactly my understanding of our prior conversation. Um, certainly that the subcommittees were, could be valuable for historical memory. Um, I do not um, remember a division that would prohibit staff from talking to a subcommittee about proposed revisions. And I'm not sure I understand that division given that historical memory could be relevant to that. So staff might say, we were thinking of this um, and we know there's some history to the revision. Um, uh, can we talk about that? Um, so I don't really understand that. And that is not exactly my recollection of our prior discussion. 
during which we asked staff what they thought would be useful. And my understanding was that um, there wasn't a need for a formal sort of process of a layer of a subcommittee, but that the subcommittees should be available. So that's my own understanding. Um, I may, again, like need to hear the whole thing, um, but uh, I will also ask for Mr. Lay and Ms. Sierra's um, input if they have any they'd like to give. Uh, Ms. Sierra? Um, yes, yeah. so uh, my memory about this is uh, similar to the chairs. What I, I guess, have, it was understanding and envisioned or recalled um, was that staff would be making decisions as to which portions to come to the subcommittee to talk about if they thought, you know, that our, you know, the what we had done in the past or discussions in the past could provide guidance or just be helpful for brainstorming and thinking through the issues that we may have analyzed in the past. And so that they would have more flexibility in determining when to bring some proposed revisions um, to us or even you know, their recommendations to not revise. So I had thought it was a, had a little bit more flexibility. Then maybe it is, I mean, it would, items two and three kind of read together, maybe that is kind of the generally how it would work. I'm just not sure. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, Mr. Mr. Lay, you don't have to have input if you don't have it. I don't. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I remember anymore. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stay quiet on this one. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. I, I, um, um, I don't know how if this is useful to you, Ms. No, Dale, this right? is useful. I mean, I appreciate it. And I think that we might be saying the same thing, just in different ways. What uh, Mrs. Sierra said at the end of her comments is uh, kind of what we have in mind that the staff will be able to reach out to the committee if the staff considers that helpful or necessary. The gist of this um, uh, uh, proposal or our understanding comes more from the perspective of if there is any discussion that needs to be had about proposed revisions, that discussion is better, um, in, the, the best place for that discussion would be the board with all of us as, as members, as opposed to a um, subcommittee that is only composed of two members. Obviously those discussions will be potentially, um, well not potentially for sure, uh, object to uh, decision-making by the board. So for transparency reasons, and just to make sure that everybody receives the same information, um, the idea in the, that as I understood it, um, was that outside of consulting as needed for historical memory, which can happen at, at any point to Mrs. Orban's um, comment, that in terms of um, proposals for changes, uh, that we will follow a process that I think we're gonna discuss in the next slide. So let's go to the next slide and maybe retake this item at the end once we have Actually, more of the full picture. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, before we move to the next slide, since we are talking about it, I wonder if maybe the word that is doing the work and creating the confusion here is the word review. Um, so is it the that um, the thought is that the subcommittee doesn't provide an additional sort of layer um, in any official way, um, but that staff um, might talk to the subcommittee um, yeah. to get its input in historical memory as they're working on things, including the proposed revisions. Um, I will say that the subcommittees do have, they have no power to make decisions. Um, and so um, any discussion that requires a decision will be had by the full board. Um, that, that's and, just, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I think we have a like a Rashomon view of the word review, um, which I which I was finding slightly confusing. So if I can summarize um, and ask Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson if it seems as though we have a shared understanding um, now uh, that um, the subcommittees aren't um, providing a sort of official layer uh, through which the proposed um, revisions. Um, comments, handle, handling of comments will go. And that does include mostly the update rules subcommittee, but of course the new rules subcommittee did do some work that is in the proposed package. So it could involve 
both subcommittees. They will not provide any kind of an official layer, but they are available to the staff for discussion um, and input as the staff is working through its processing of the comments and its um, work to prepare um, to help the board um, make a decision about what changes to make or to not make to the rules. I appreciate this summary. I would like to turn to our executive director because really the agency is the one that has to have clarity on this and just to ask him whether this conversation brings enough clarity for staff uh, or maybe we're missing something. Thank you, and I do. I think the, uh, the, the summarization is great. And now I have another Kurosawa film to watch because uh, of that reference. So thank you. Yep. Okay, perfect. So then yeah. maybe we can move. Go ahead. I was going to move forward, but I, you know, I think the purpose of this was we talked about it once. Um, and in the discussion we had had with the staff, there was a lack of clarity about what the board's view was um, because we, I think, the expression, there, there were various expressions of views that they were ha having trouble reconciling. So the thought was, let's put something in writing that we can discuss that they can then rely upon as, as they are considering and proposing revisions to the rules. I'm gonna go forward with the rest of the presentation because I think the chair's point about considering this in the broader context of the process might also be helpful in illuminating um, as, as we talk about this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide, sorry. Um, so as, as Ms. Delatory described, you know, we are gonna need to process proposed changes to the draft regulations. Um, and so we laid out this flowchart of what we are proposing and, and would like feedback on, um, not knowing how many proposed changes there might be, um, there could be a, a, a small volume or a large volume. And a process that is used in a lot of other bodies is a consent agenda, which is non-controversial items. Um, and so what we're, what we're envisioning, and I'll describe this in greater detail in the subsequent slides, is in, a, in the meeting, the board meeting that we would um, uh, have to consider proposed revisions to the draft rules, there we would start with a presentation of a consent agenda, which would be items that, as I mentioned, that are non-controversial. We would deliberate on that uh, agenda of changes, that list of changes, and then vote on, on those non-controversial changes, which would then dispose of a certain volume of the, the proposed revisions to the draft regulations. Once that was disposed of, we could then move on to the items that perhaps were controversial or complicated and required individual consideration and deliberation by the board. Um, so um, imagine the, the staff would present, you know, in section X, the draft said this, we're proposing, a modif in response to a comment, we're proposing to modify section X to read this way. Uh, they would present a, a rationale for the change, and then we would dispose of, of that recommendation, either accepting it or modifying it uh, as, as the deliberation warranted. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, I, I described this to some extent already, um, but you know the intent is the efficient disposition of non-controversial items that are grouped together in one agenda item. Um, and then are considered and, and approved potentially on block. So there, there's not an intention to have a debate around it. Um, we would all have visibility into the change, uh, the changes that were proposed in the consent agenda. Um, and they would that consent agenda would be identified and proposed by the agency staff. Uh, we would all have visibility into it prior to the board meeting and at the at the initial presentation of this agenda item, the consent agenda, any one of us could say, I'd like to pull number 17 off of the consent agenda and deliberate upon it individually. 
Uh, and that could be for any reason. It does not necessarily mean that that board member disagrees with the proposal or that they think it's controversial. It could be that it, a belief that it needs individual visibility to the public and the rest of the board, whatever the reason might be, but that any individual board member could, could remove an item from the consent agenda and that would result in its individual deliberation and disposition. Um, thinking about how this process will work once all of the comments are logged and, and responded to and, and um, revisions are drafted, we all need to be prepared. There, there are going to be multiple meetings that we will need to, to have and the potential for a large volume of work and, and multiple day meetings. Um, during those meetings, as I mentioned, so you know the board, the staff may propose a change, and we could either just you know deliberate upon it and and accept it or reject it, um, or ask for a modification. We may need to take breaks during the meeting for a modification to be drafted. So you know that that could interrupt the flow. But uh, if we're going to dispose of an item and the 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 view of the board is that it should be modified for the efficiency of the process and, and reducing the number of required meetings, we propose that the actual text of the modification be available and voted upon during the meeting rather than uh, a conceptual guidance that then results in another vote at a subsequent meeting. Um, Then moving on to the middle item there, uh, in-person versus remote meetings. Um, you know, we will have a revision to the draft, and then we will need a subsequent meeting to, that will be after a, a, there'll be revisions to the draft, there'll be a public comment period on the revised draft, and then a subsequent meeting. Um, the subsequent meeting presumably, and we believe will have few, if any, additional revisions to the regulations. Uh, and so it, our belief is that an in-person meeting for that first meeting, where there is substantial deliberation and debate, should be in-person, that it would be more effective. Uh, we, we would deliberate as a group more effectively in-person uh, for that first meeting. The, the subsequent meeting, um, which may just be as simple as a, a final approval of the revised regulations, is more um, conducive to a remote meeting, but that our, our view and proposal is that that first meeting that we anticipate being more substantive be in person. Um, and then to the extent that any of us have changes we would like to propose, um, the staff would be available to help us draft them. Uh, and that that is a recommended and preferred approach is that we rely upon staff for drafting assistance um, so that they can our all of our proposed changes conform to OAL's uh, requirements and other rules so that we have consistency in drafting. Um, so you know that could be done prior to the meeting where an individual board member requests assistant drafting assistance from from the staff. Um, this, this might have been better to lay out prior to the consent agenda, but there are three general categories of changes. Um, one are changes that may be made in response to comments, but are, are viewed by the staff as, as non-contentious, non-controversial, non-complex, perhaps, and that those could be grouped in, in a consent agenda. Uh, and those would be subject to our review. And as I mentioned, any one of us could pull them off the consent agenda. There are the ones that the staff proposes and we concur should be individually discussed and deliberated upon and individually approved. And then there's non-substantive, which in my parlance is technical and conforming changes that the staff has the authority to make. Um, you know, if there's a typo, if there's, if there are, non-substantive changes to make, they have the authority to make those. Um, this last point was intended less for how we dispose of rules changes, but perhaps a general observation of how we operate that we, we should look at 
are there votes? We take we tend to take roll call votes for every action we take, and do, are roll calls required for everything? And are there are there actions that we could start looking at a voice vote? Um, and there may be a difference in how remote meetings are handled versus in person meetings under the executive order. Um, but if we end up with a lot of votes, we may want non contentious, non complex votes to be. Okay, I can, I can I can answer this quickly. Um, when we do a remote meeting, we have to do roll call votes under Bagley King. That's okay. the law. Um, that's the end of the presentation. So hopefully that gives some context and, and helps folks to, I'm gonna stop sharing the, the slides as well. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson, and for being our technical hero on top of everything else. Did you want uh, to, um, did you want to say anything in particular about the discussion before we start? I was going to ask Ms. De La Torre if there was anything she wanted to add before we turn it over to, to discussion. Very good. No, I think that this was a very dense presentation for the members of the board that might not be members of the subcommittee. So I just want to make sure that we allow time for them to kind of um, absorb the information and, and share their thoughts and questions. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. I do have some questions, um, but first I want to invite Mr. Lay or Ms. Sierra, if you have questions. It, I think here's what I suggest. I suggest we start with clarifying questions um, and then we move into discussion. Just me? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, Ms. Sierra. Okay, just um, one quick question. Well, fairly quick question. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So with respect, we'll have a re we will be receiving a proposal from staff as to you know, which regulations they recommend be modified. And to the extent there may be a regulation that one or more board members feels that well, staff has not um, recommended a change to that particular regulation, but I'm interested in potentially um, seeing that revised or having a discussion. Is that something then that that type of thing could also be moved into the list of de deliberations because a staff member would have communicated to, I mean, the board member would have communicated to staff that they're interested in a change. Is that is that how that would work? If I'm understanding your question correctly, mm -hmm. so there, there are changes, there, there's comments that the agency right. has Right? right, and those will all be logged, and um, a disposition will be proposed. Right. Separately from that, during deliberation on the rules, the board members could propose changes that were not generated by public comment. I, I, if that's what you're asking, um, not so much that. I, I, I guess what I was just, and I'm sorry, I'm not as clear that the staff will be presenting us the regulations that they're proposing to revise or that we revise, but there's gonna be a set of regulations that they're proposing that should stay as is, despite the comments, because they'll have consider the comments and feel that there are reasons not to make a modification. Or the comments, be, you the know, comments may say there is no need for a modification. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Or yeah, that, you know, the analyzing the comments and, you know, given the analysis that, you know, we feel, as an agency that we're not gonna make that change, but one or more board members might want to deliberate on that type of decision too. And so I, I guess, is there gonna be a process for that? I just wanted to highlight something that maybe we didn't stress uh, during the presentation, which is we do expect before we meet as the board that the staff will have an opportunity to communicate individually with each board member in terms of um, giving them an update on the filing of new comments. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great opportunity, I think, for board members that might have questions about edits that might not be proposed to bring it, if possible, at that time to the attention of the staff, just to make sure that the staff is ready to have that conversation during the board meeting. Um, I imagine, and maybe this is a question that we have to bring back to our legal department for, you know, Bagley King and Clarity, but I imagine like Mrs. Sierra suggests, is suggesting that if you're in the meeting, you know, a board member, you know, comes with up with an idea that maybe was not 
part of what this was um, in, included in the initial conversations that that conversation should be had at the board member, but there is a great advantage to bring those to the attention of the staff early because the staff is really going to decide what goes into the consent calendar and then what requires individual conversations. And we anticipate that the staff for every item that goes into individual conversations or, or for a group of items that are logically related, that they will be presented by the staff with an explanation as to why these changes were made and, and that enables the communication. So if we surprise the staff with new things, um, we don't put them in the best position to provide clarity. Thank you. I actually, is it all right if I would like to actually insert some of my questions here because I think they're on the same lines and, and it might help. They're very basic clarifying questions. So as I understood you, Mr. Thompson, what you're calling the consent calendar items would be voted on prior to discussion of items that will be separately discussed by the board. That's one question. Correct. Okay. And then secondly, how will board members request that things be taken out from what you're calling the consent calendar? Is that something that they email to staff at any time? Is that something that needs to happen in that first discussion in the board meeting? Um, I had another option, which I've forgotten. I was just trying to picture how that would happen. So um, the we have to notice our meetings, right? 10 days ahead of time. And what we're envisioning is that the, the items on the consent calendar would be noticed prior to the meeting. So, you know, these items are proposed to be on the consent calendar. The, at the meeting, any one of us could say, well, I'd like item number 12 to be removed from the consent calendar and debated separately. What Ms. Delatore was flagging and there's an interplay between these things is we don't want to surprise the staff that they are now going to have to do a presentation on item number 12 um, when they didn't think they were going to have to. So as we are, we should communicate with them individually and in a Bagley King compliant way. Um, I, I'm intending to pull this off of the consent calendar so that they are prepared to present on it so they're not surprised. But they would okay. not obviously be able to share that information among any of the rest of us um, to avoid uh, a serial deliberation. They may get the same feedback, right? You and Ms. Sierra may independently communicate a desire to pull an item off, but you would not know that the other had that intention. But the staff would be prepared then to present that item. Okay. Yes, and in addition to the staff, um, we wouldn't want to surprise the public either about individual things. So, and it sounds like that is taken into account with a prior prior to um, the meeting communication. Um, is the idea that board members kind Sorry, of- Sorry, can I interrupt? You're raising yeah. an interesting point that was not envisioned that, that the- that the public would know that item 12 was being removed until the commencement of the meeting. Okay, um, under Bagley Keen, and I will get advice so that I do this correctly, but I am almost certain that any specific thing that we discuss would have to be noticed on the agenda. I'm not entirely the following. consent calendar. So if we have a bulk set of um, proposed regulations, uh, that the board will sort of discuss at once. That's one thing. Then if we have um, an item that the board is going to deliberate on individually and receive information from the staff, I believe that would have to be, the public would need notice that we were going to do that. Mr. Sible, am I, yeah. That, that is correct. The public would need to be aware in order to be able to participate and, and provide comment on that. I think we're going to need to do a little bit more work on this because this 
same procedure is used very frequently in a Brown Act compliant way, um, which is obviously not identical to Bagley Keen, but city councils use this procedure all the time. And so perhaps a presentation of a list with the caveat that an item could be removed from that mm -hmm. list uh, live in a meeting. I think we, I think you're raising an interesting point, but I think we might need to do a little bit more research on how it could be done in a compliant way. Thank you, um, Mr. Thompson. I'm not sure what you mean by this part of the process, but um, I'm going to ask Mr. Sibley. Well, I, I just had a question, and you, Mr. Thompson, mentioned the, the the comparison to a Brown Act process. I just wonder if, in that Brown Act process, when the City Council is doing this, are they adopting a regulation pursuant to the requirements of the California Administrative Procedures Act? Because the APA applies to state level governing bodies, and I'm not sure. In your scenario, you may be talking about the adoption of an ordinance, which may not be the APA process. I, I'm going to suggest that to the extent that we don't have full clarity, we shouldn't put our general counsel in the position to have to answer with a lot of granularity uh, without giving him the benefit of doing additional research, um, just, just for clarity for the public and just uh, so this, for this, ourselves. This, well. is, this, is, this, is, this is what I suggest, that we get clarity on um, what the proposal is. And of course, council is going to have to um, review that. Um, and we will, you know, we'll try not to make things super difficult for them by doing something that is obviously wrong. But um, so I just want to back up. Um, so uh, that I understand the order. So um, what's called the consent calendar, the sort of bulk stuff, um, excuse me for my lack of articulateness and word choice, um, that would go onto um, a board agenda. The board would vote to take the staff's recommendation for disposing of that stuff. And there may also be items that the board will take um, analysis and recommendations from the staff on individually and deliberate and potentially vote, and vote on separately. Um, and I'm still wondering how we um, communicate those things. So it sounds to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that individual board members could tell the staff of items that they have. And my second timing question is, can I now um, tell the staff, um, I know that I am going to uh, want for the board to discuss proposed regulation number seven X, Y, Z. Is that part, is that the idea? I, I apologize, but I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, this is okay, um, it's, I'm sure it's my fault that I, that I wasn't clear. So I can imagine two different things. One is that a proposed consent agenda set is communicated in some way, presumably for a board meeting. And at that point, board members say individually, I would like this item pulled away, this item pulled away, this item pulled away. And then non-exclusively, there is um, a path by which board members before there is a consent um, agenda produced say, I know that there is X, Y, Z item that I think the board should discuss individually so that it goes actually into the construction of the agenda for the board meeting um, prior to prior to the what's being called the consent agenda being constructed. Can I play that back and see if I'm understanding what you're asking? Sure. So the staff is going to say there's 50 proposed changes. Mm -hmm. The staff is going to construct a consent agenda and say they are planning on a consent agenda of 38 items mm -hmm. that would just go together. We won't know prior to their publication what is on that proposed list of 38 or even how many there are. It, I think what I'm hearing you ask, and I just want to clarify, is if I know that a particular thing is important to me, that I preemptively say, don't put number 12 on the consent calendar because I'll just pull it off. Is that kind of what you meant? 
Well, other than the don't pull it off. Um, but yeah, just I would like this not to be on the consent calendar because I've read the comments and okay. um, I don't think it's appropriate. Got it. So is that I, built in? I'll speak for myself that, that hadn't contemplated a kind of preemptive um, expression of interest we were envisioning a process by which each board member would get a briefing from the staff. Um, and it strikes me in the moment as appropriate to, for an individual board member to say at that time, this is important. I think it deserves individual deliberation. I think that's, that is an appropriate thing for a board member to, to say. And, and that would be indicative that uh, I can't imagine the staff would not concur with that that mechanism. I was going the extra step of pulling it off the consent calendar because that could be the, the outcome if if that feedback was not uh, followed. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I just wanted to bring that. that Mr. Lay, um, it, it, please. What I'm hearing is maybe there's a desire for two opportunities to pull things off the consent agenda, one preemptively, and then one uh, when the meeting happens. Is that is that what I'm hearing? So before, you can tell staff, hey, don't put this on the consent agenda. Once that consent agenda is created, the meeting starts, you can also pull it off at that point. Is that is that what um, is being proposed here? I have, oh, I've, I've honestly been trying to understand what the picture was. Um, so I hadn't um, offered an opinion necessarily yet. Um, I was simply trying to understand the sequence of events. Right, the, the um, um, proposed process is meant to ensure that we enable discussions on points that individual members might wanna discuss. And at the same time, um, dispose of the things where there is no need for a conversation in a way that's um, efficient. I do not believe that as a board member, the, um, you know, the, the decision of the staff to create a consent calendar should be as informed as possible. But I do agree with what uh, Mr. Lay mentioned, which is that if the proposed consent calendar contains an item that an individual member thinks should not be part of it, then uh, there should be a second opportunity to um, ask for a discussion. I think the question that Mrs. Irvine is presenting is basically whether that might need another agenda, which means potentially another meeting 10 days later. And I don't have a full answer for that question. I think that that's something that perhaps we can let our um, legal counsel advise around. If there is a way, uh, Mr. Thomas suggested maybe in the initial agenda, it can be mentioned that items can be pulled out. Um, I don't know if that's you know the, the correct way of addressing it. Um, we should allow time for our legal counsel to give us the answer. And if the answer is, if a member chooses to pull out and item from the agenda that is set for consent, we're just gonna need to meet again in 10 days, then that you know that might be the answer. Okay. Um, other questions? Um, comments? Yes, Mr. Light. Yeah, I, I, I want to say, you know, thanks for uh, to the to the subcommittee for this work. Um, you know, I, there's this very similar process at the CPUC or on the consent agenda, so I, I'm relatively familiar with it. So, um, yeah, I think it makes sense. We'll just have to figure out the the little mechanics around that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So my questions were coming out of trying to understand and think through how these some of these very specific um, components 
connect to the agency's role as an administrative agency in rulemaking, the board's role, the staff's role as expert advisors, and the public's role um, as um, a very important um, participant in the process. And I really appreciate the subcommittee's careful attention to process. Process is very important, um, as you have conveyed um, in the work that you've done. I have some concerns about this process, um, uh, which um, are probably pretty minor, but they, um, they are there. Um, this process suggests to me that we will be allocating a lot of staff time and a lot of board time and a lot of public time um, on potentially, um, you know, suggestions from the board that the staff then need to try to implement on the fly. Um, and I'm not, you know, suggesting that um, this wasn't carefully thought about, but I do think that we need to balance the overall job that we need to do for the public um, and the staff's ability to be flexible in how they respond to the comments and how they prepare the board um, with um, making sure that the board has full opportunity to discuss anything the board would like to discuss and the public also has opportunity to weigh in. Um, I would say at a minimum that specifics, like whether we have an in-person meeting or a remote meeting, and I do understand the value of in-person meetings, be left to the staff. Um, and that the board also recognize that if we have a multi-day meeting, which I fully accept we may need to, that that is a real burden on staff. Um, and that, um, for example, um, if we're trying to balance our jobs as volunteers, which is how the voters have set up this particular agency um, uh, and find that time that we might, for example, need to have a two-day meeting that runs into a Saturday, that that has real implications for staff and it especially has implications um, if it were an in-person meeting. So I would really um, strongly prefer, and in fact, um, my strong opinion is that those kinds of details be at the discretion of the staff. Um, I really do appreciate the, um, the thought about how to manage efficiently and to fully hold and yet fully hold discussion on the rules themselves. Um, I'm puzzled by the term consent calendar because that sounds like a legislative process to me, but if the CPUC uses it, that's good enough for me. And the concept, you know, the, the name doesn't really matter for the concept, but it did, I think I got, one of the reasons I was asking about the timing um, is because I have a vision in my mind for what that is and the purpose that it serves. And it is a purpose that um, is often much more of a sort of jostle um, among the decision makers than I think an administrative agency needs to be. Um, but now that I'm understanding sort of the idea, that seems to make sense. I would like to make a substantive suggestion, um, Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre, and by extension to the staff, which is that I'm, I appreciate very much the idea of disposing of um, whatever is on that consent calendar efficiently at the beginning. I do wonder though, if um, it ultimately would be more efficient to um, dispose of it after the board talks about some individual items, simply because I don't know how those discussions might end up affecting things that were on the consent calendar. And of course, then things could individually be pulled off. But as I'm thinking about our ability to efficiently schedule meetings and try to have a full board and public discussion without having to schedule a new meeting over and over, I wonder if it might be better to do the bulk actually at the end when we know that that's the bulk and that we're going to get it out of the way. Um, so I have a number, a number of thoughts. Um, I would strongly 
like for the staff to have discretion in a number of these areas. Um, I'd be very interested to hear if there are particular process points that it is really important um, for the board um, to weigh in on um, and that we, we work with those. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, I'll, I'll second you. There, I do think there needs to be some tweaks. And, and the way the PUC does it is it's on very individual decisions, right? And, and it'll be like a piece of legislation or um, it, it's not quite like a regulation where there's all these different pieces moving together. So I do agree there needs to be some tweaks, but I, I do think I like the idea of disposing of non-controversial items as quickly as possible so we can save time on the other end. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree that there needs to be some tweaks to, to account for that. Yeah, I agree. It's attractive. I just have worries that we might end up with more steps. Um, Mr. Sibley? Uh, I, I just wanted to point out that the CPUC, when they adopt their regulations, they don't necessarily adopt regulation. They adopt an order of the, of the commission. And so they don't go through the process of, of having to submit something to the Office of Administrative Law. They do their hearing, and then they adopt it as an order of the commission. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a pretty different process. The last piece of my um, comments on this is that it does seem as though there are some uh, specific questions regarding how the California Administrative Procedures Act and Bagley Keene intersect. And so again, um, I think that a good course of action would be to give discretion um, to the staff understanding that the sense of the board is that we have a process that does these things and fulfills these values, which I think Mr. Thompson laid out quite well when he was walking through that, but that they have the freedom to conform it to what is required um, under the law. Ms. Sierra? Um, yes. Um, you know, well, I, I do really appreciate the work that's been done on this. I mean, this is a very, it's a complicated issue. And I, and I, so I really appreciate the thought that's gone into this. And I think that it seems to me um, the chair's um, idea of this is kind of, as I'm hearing it, kind of a general um, guidance to our staff, but that if they have flexibility, that will be very helpful because sometimes things, you know, in theory, you know, look one way. And then when you're really in the nitty gritty of the actual issues, you know, then you may see, well, here's a hiccup or we'll need to, we'll need to tweak this a little bit. And so I think, you know, this discussion and what you've outlined, I think really does provide a lot of guidance to them, but I would second the thought of that ultimately there will be some discretion or should the staff will have discretion on kind of how to roll this out. And it seems to me too, the point that um, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson brought up, that we'll be having these individual discussions with staff and that should go a long way in their understanding individual um, board members concerns of any or areas that they really are um, thinking about needing more deliberation. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. And I do think that there are clearly some components that are really important as I hear it. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Thompson and Ms. Dilatory. One is um, working for efficient disposition by using the consent calendar method. One is ensuring that board members understand that they can um, put thing, take things off of that out of that grouping for individual discussion um, and um, that those components are, are really important. Um, so I certainly don't want to suggest that I think anything other than that. Um, I do think that there should be some flexibility. Mr. Sultani. Great, um, let me lower my hand. Um, I really appreciate the, the discussion and I think this is I'm going to be incredibly important for us to get clear guidance from the board on what this process will look like um, and at what level. Um, I want to flag that we have quite a large initial regs package out there and there will likely be quite a number of changes in response to comments. And many of those changes are interrelated, right? They're, they're kind of pieces that kind of work together. And if we tweak one, they, we also have to make subsequent tweaks elsewhere. 
Um, so I think similar to the budget question that, in the budget discussion that came up, there's kind of a general question at the level that the board intends to provide guidance to staff, right? If, if you know, I think we've contemplated, you know, high level guidance and direction, but also suggest language tweaks or deliberation of a particular agenda item or, or, or a rule change. And I think um, we just want to kind of be mindful of the time commitment that, um, that that will require as well as some of the other considerations, right? Specifically, the you know the final rulemaking package, the FSOR, will have outlined every change as well as every reason for change. And ultimately, the reasons for that change, the arbiter of whether we've addressed those probably are the Office of Administrative, uh, Administrative Law, OAL. And um, ultimately, there may even be changes that the board recommends or suggests that go contrary to what our requirements are for uh, OAL or what OAL may approve. So again, I have no particular concerns about the process the board wants to pursue, but I just wanna highlight both these external requirements in terms of rulemaking process and time requirements um, that this will ultimately undertake. You know, as you know, the and it's brought up, been brought up before, the interplay between Bagley Keene and APA is quite um, pronounced in the sense that it adds a significant amount of time to the process. For example, if we think we're going to have multiple um, conversations, deliberations to go over the rules of a kind of these large set of rules, and there might be different items that are on the consent calendar that are that then get pulled off, we're likely going to um, need to uh, schedule multiple back-to-back -back meetings, including you know multi-day single meetings as well as back-to-back -back meetings spaced a few days apart to allow staff to um, address some of those changes and come back to the board and provide uh, the board enough time to review those changes. And those all have to be planned with this 10-day um, a uh, bag of key requirement to give the public notice as well. And so I want to just flag that it'd be great to have a strong signal from the board in terms of their, again, their level of engagement they intend and, you know, having personally looked through the rules and, and seen the size and complexity, I, I think that I would urge the board again to go back and, and uh, approach it from that angle. And then in addition, get a strong signal from the board as to really their availability and amount of time commitment in terms of availability and timing like you know are we talking about october uh november you know like what's our time frame for this to do these meetings because i will flag that now we're staff is pursuing or or, or trying to respond at a quite rapid clip to you know to pressures from the public that we have our rules out and we're working you know running the candle at both ends but i want to flag that this time this this process is going to add significant time and and require a big time commitment from the board. So I'd love at the end of this meeting to know like when should we plan our next meetings, how many roughly, um, and what is the board's ability to uh, to make those meetings. And ultimately, I realize it's hard to know, but that will be that will the level at which you all intend to interact and go through it um, will dictate how many meetings and how how long they need to be. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Sultani. Um, I think it's going to be a little hard for the board to predict exactly the level at which it will um, interact with the specific rules. Um, one thing about Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre's um, presentation was that they suggested that um, a sort of favorable approach would be to direct the board, or sorry, direct the staff. Uh, with regards to uh, a pol policy um, for the staff to execute, but the board may also have individual line changes. I think it's important that we um, preserve that and that there may be some limit to what we can predict, but this is what I would like to do. Um, let's go through the um, proposal and see if we can get you some clarity on some of that detail. So it seems to me that there is support for and that it is pretty central to Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Troy's proposal that there be um, some kind of what they are calling a consent agenda, um, where that items that you know the whole public agrees on, no or no, but you know, just aren't controversial, or for whatever reason, staff and its judgment thinks um, uh, is best dealt with um, in bulk, that that be a component that board members be able um, to um, say the, that there are items that they do not think should be part of that bulk. And I should say 
I believe uh, implicit is that there may be items that the staff thinks the board needs to talk about. Specifically, thank you, Mr. Thompson, for nodding. I realized I was like making an assumption, and that's always dangerous. Um, uh, that that structure um, is important. That structure is going to have to be executed in a way that is compliant with the uh, California Administrative Procedures Act and the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. But the board would like there to be the in the the this is in my my formulation, which people can then challenge if they'd like. Um, that there would be in uh, individual um, channels of communication. Um, that is both including sort of briefing from the staff and also the board members being able to say this should or should not be in the consent calendar. Um, compliant with Bagley King, um, agendas will be set up to as efficiently as possible um, cover whatever is appropriate for that meeting. Um, I would like to see this um, developed so that we minimize, if we can, and we may not be able to under Bagley Kane, minimize the kinds of conversations we have that look like, okay, um, we have a new topic and now we're gonna have to notice another meeting for that. So to the extent that we can notice things as efficiently as possible, um, uh, I would like to do that. Um, I really do hear Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre's um, preference for in-person meeting to sort of kick things off. I do think that's important. However, I think that that should be within the staff's discretion and take into account what board members' realistic um, uh, availabilities are so that we can devote as much of our time and attention as um, is necessary to doing our homework and being sure that we are familiar with everything we need to be familiar with and that we can have an efficient and um, um, informative meeting for the public. Um, and I do think that we may end up having to twiddle with the consent calendar if we try to do it first, but you know, I'm down with trying whatever um, people think is gonna make sense. But again, I would ask that the, board, that the staff have discretion um, if they find out something um, uh, after this meeting that would make one of those choices obviously better or worse um, to make that decision. And I'm happy to talk um, about dates, but I think we should kind of make sure we have like a structure that we um, can give guidance to the staff on. I appreciate the summary. I just wanted to add one thing. When we're talking about um, calendaring any specific meeting, as the um, chair suggested, it might be that it makes more sense to deal with the um, consent calendar at the end. In my view, that is really a decision of the chair, how things are organized in the meeting. They just happen to be in the slides uh, that we were presenting. You know, the consent calendar goes first, but in my, in my view, it's not only the discretion of the staff, but also the discretion of the chair in terms of how uh, things are agendized and then dealt with in the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, I would add to a couple of things. One is, this is the kind of discussion and feedback that we were hoping would flow from, from the presentation. So this is helpful. Um, and we can work out the mechanics um, based on some of the feedback. Um, one, a, a couple of clarifying questions to the chair. Uh, well, one is a clarifying point, one's a clarifying question. Um, the, in the, we were not intending to dictate the format or timing of meetings, but to have a discussion that gave the staff the guidance they needed to determine whether or not meetings should be in person or remote and how they be stacked and sequenced. In part because the preference that we express needs to align with our availability. And there's been a disconnect uh, to some extent in, in that in the past and, and our ability to all be available at the same time. So um, if we gave the impression that we were as a subcommittee seeking to dictate 
the timing form of, of the meetings. That that was a that was a miscommunication on our part. Um, the presentation and the discussion had been done hand in glove with with the staff uh, every step of the way. So there, there was not that was not an intention to micromanage or, or dictate, but rather just to, to prompt this kind of discussion that would give the guidance that is needed, um, the board guidance to the staff that, that is needed. Um, I forgot what my clarifying question was. There was something that you said that I didn't quite follow, but I've now forgotten what it was. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thompson. And that is loud. It better be loud because it happens to me all the time. Also, I was catching sight of my face on Zoom um, and I, I look very serious. I want to be sure that everyone realizes this is my serious, my serious face is my face like when I'm thinking through different things and how they work together. Um, uh, so please don't misinterpret my um, my resting serious um, face. I'm listening and thinking, um, and I appreciate um, that um, very much, Mr. Thompson. I would like to pick up on Mr. Thompson's observation um, about essentially logistics and how that interacts with the board members' availability and time, as, as well as Mr. Sultani's um, question about that, so that staff. Um, do have guidance. I also realize that people may not have their calendars exactly available, but I want to point out two things which I think are important um, uh, and important um, for the public to understand as well, which is that as I alluded to earlier in our conversation, the voters made a decision um, in our implementing statute as to how this board is constructed um, and sort of what its form is. And its form is as, as a five member board appointed by different appointing authorities who are volunteers um, with, um, you know, with a per diem, but who are volunteers. That is a structure that is very common across commissions and boards in California. It is not the case for all of them, however. Some are full time, and that was a different, um, that would be a different model that another legislature or another set of voters might have made. So when the public is listening to, uh, to us discuss this, they are in part listening to us think through how to best implement the um, balance that is um, provided for us by the voters in the statute. Um, and that, that structure dictates um, a certain role for staff thank heavens, because our staff are crackerjack and expert, and um, a, a sort of a level of interaction um, for the board. And here I want to pause because I don't think I've said this enough recently, which is to thank the board for the tremendous amount of effort and time that they have continued to put in as we've built the agency. Um, a lot of boards meet, you know, once, twice a year, maybe once a quarter, um, and I know that this board has been putting in a lot. And as we go into the substantive part of the rulemaking, um, we are being asked and are asking a lot. So I want to pause and appreciate that. But I um, to get to the, the point of, um, you know, what it is the public is seeing us um, discuss and what it is that we are doing. Um, I think that the board really needs to think through what are what is our best contribution here, what is our most important contribution for the public, and that we be sure that we leave time um, for us to be very definitely substantively up to speed, um, so that we have the best kind of conversation and the sort of fullest um, analysis um, for the public. So with that, um, in talking about meetings. Um, most of us have jobs, um, and so I do think it's a good idea to help um, Mr. Sultani know kind of what the basic parameters are. And I'll start with mine just to begin. Um, I um, can do Fridays, usually. Um, I could do Saturdays, um, and sometimes I can do Thursday afternoon. Um, Ms. De La Troy. Apologies, I'm a little confused. I thought we were so we're now just sharing our availability. Um, oh, know. I'm sorry. If I skipped ahead, please um, let's let's go let's go back. I thought I thought we had kind of walked through the structure. 
Um, but if there's more comment on that, let's, by all means, let's discuss it. Oh, okay, I, I, I was just going to suggest that given the discussion that we have had, it might make sense or it makes sense in my mind to anticipate that we should have a meeting between now and the day that we get together to discuss the rules, just for my committee to prepare a new presentation that is more concrete and maybe go back to legal counsel and get some of the questions that were raised as uh, an answer. Um, and um, I'm not sure what the day should be for that, but it just seems to me that there, there are enough things that need to be um, worked out where it might make sense to have a second conversation before we find ourselves in a board meeting where we're actually implementing the process. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think that we have had a very robust discussion of process about process. Um, I could be wrong, but my um, proposal was that we have the components in place. We have an understanding of what the process subcommittee um, spent a, a lot of like time and thought to put together for us and that we should let the staff implement it in line with the law. And then if the staff um, runs into something um, where they say, oh, you know what, um, this is actually something that the board needs to talk about, then that's fine. But I would like to go ahead and, and, and have them um, put together um, that process and we start with it. Okay, so just to make sure I understand, you wouldn't expect another meeting between now and whenever we need to discuss the rules, a meeting of the board, even if it's for staff to present. I just, uh, there's value, I think, for board members to know what they expect on the day that we get together to discuss the rules. And I'm not sure that there's a better process for that to be communicated that a board meeting, given the limitations and the bad picking. Okay, thank you, Ms. Delatroy. I felt like I understood what to expect, but um, why don't I like say that? And then um, it may be that once, like I've made up a whole castle in the air, that is entirely possible. But what I thought that we had to expect is that the board, or excuse me, the staff um, are currently working through the public comments and they are comparing them to the proposed regulation. Um, they are going to be working up recommendations for revisions or non-revisions. Some of those things they're going to put on the consent calendar. Some of those things the board may say we want to discuss individually in a one-way individual communication with the staff. Um, uh, and um, that that would be the agenda for our first meeting to, dis to discuss the rules. If we could go around and make sure that all board members um, feel that there is no need for a second meeting and probably check with Mr. Ask and Sultani just to make sure that, that that's not necessary. Absolutely, 100%. And then the first, before we even do that, Ms. De La Torre, is there something that specific that you're concerned about? Because I think uh, that like we, that would be really helpful to me. I think there were some questions that were raised around uh, how things should appear in the agenda, for example, that they might need a little bit more research. Maybe that's something that can be done on the back end and then communicated to the chair. Um, I believe there's a little bit of um, feedback in terms of in-person or remote, but I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Sultani has enough feedback there to start planning, particularly if we go in person, because that means, you know, finding a room and, and booking, et cetera. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that everybody had received enough information from this meeting and felt comfortable that we didn't have to kind of um, have a second conversation before we close this agenda item. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, comments from other members of the board on this? I, I thought there was a pretty significant open question. Let me back up. I start from the premise that we have to approve any proposed changes to the rules. So one mechanism would be we could go one by one, but that seemed extraordinarily inefficient. So hence the proposal to, to group them. The, a question has arisen and, and there's complicated interplay between Bagley Keene and the APA uh, and the desires of, of the individual board members on the timing and sequence of, of that. Um, I think it would be a challenge if 
each of us had to enumerate what things we didn't want on a consent calendar in order for a consent calendar to be constructed. Um, but there's a, there's a, I think there's a, a sequence problem and a Bagley Keen problem. We can't have a discussion, I don't think, the board, I don't think the staff could say, here's a proposed consent calendar. Are you okay with that to each of us individually without that being publicly available? So that's seemed like a challenge versus publishing one and us arriving at a meeting and moving something from a consent agenda onto an individual agenda item. So I, I thought I came away with there needed to be some additional guidance, research and guidance from the staff on how that could work um, and how the how Bagley Keen and the APA would interplay and allow us to efficiently and effectively group things together, um, but remain compliant with, with the underlying rules and statutes. Um, I, I that that remained fairly open, a fairly open question to me on what that would look like. Um, thank you. If, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, First of all, let me, let me let me let me before walking into the meeting, that would be helpful. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Let, let me clarify. Um, I was hoping to clarify whether the subcommittee's idea was that um, board members might say kind of at the outset, because we're reading the comments, like this doesn't look like it should go in the consent agenda. And also, of course, have the opportunity to say, these are things that will be taken off the consent agenda um, and that the staff will, um, organize that in a way that complies with Bagley King. So if we need to have a meeting um, that has the consent agenda and maybe three items that staff themselves think shouldn't be on the consent agenda, or they know um, a board member doesn't want on the consent agenda, we can work on that. Um, and at that meeting, um, board members also may have things that they want to pull from the consent agenda. Um, I was, I was, I was unsure about whether disposing of the consent agenda first might get us in trouble later. Um, but um, Mr. Mr. Lay, I think was not as concerned. I think you were not as concerned. I'm completely happy to go with um, the consent agenda first. Um, and then if we run into a challenge, we'll run into a challenge. Um, but you know, that that's fine with me. Um, so my feeling was that we have like the building blocks um, that staff need to get started. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I'm okay with keeping the consent, at, putting the consent at the end, considering this is an adaptation of a different system. Um, I, I do think, hopefully, Ashkan and, and um, uh, the subcommittee has enough to go on to, to develop. I think we've, <laughs> I think we've covered it a lot, um, and uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm totally okay with putting the consent calendar at the end. Great, um, thank you. Um, I, and I agree, and I should say that whatever, and I appreciate Ms. De La Torre saying, you know, staff, chair, figure out how to put them on the agenda. Bagley Keene is the music of our lives and nothing will be done that doesn't comply with Bagley Keene. But I do not think that we need to come back um, and, and talk about what Bagley Keene requires separately. Um, Ms. Sierra, um, did you have further to say? Um, yes, just I agree with that. I would be in favor of moving forward, you know, based on this discussion, I do think in the summaries that I think that staff has, you know, enough to move forward and that our next meeting, we start dealing more with the substance, you know, given, you know, how much work there is to do um, and timing issues, that would be um, my observation. Thank and you, Ms. Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, we have, this has been a very helpful discussion and I think that we're ready to go to the next step and see how it goes. And it may be that there'll need to be more meetings than we had thought, but at least we can get started. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, yes, and the subcommittee's done a lot of, of heavy lifting. And are you comfortable with the caveat that we move forward and then of course we run into something um, and Ms. De La Torre's like hesitancy becomes manifest yes. um, that of course we would agendize, uh, I, I would agendize something and we would calendar yes. a meeting. Um, yes. Mr. Sultani. Great, thank you for that. And indeed um, the discussion has been helpful. I'm gonna take as kind of our marching orders to go ahead and kind of start 
one researching the process on you know whether it's a consent calendar or how we describe it but but on how to flag items to deliberate and and uh and flag items to just kind of um uh discuss at the end i agree actually agree with the order of operations for that reason that i said the interplay because we might have something on the consent calendar that we tweak sorry that's not on the consent calendar that we tweak that then affects something on the consent calendar so i think doing the 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 deliberation first um our plan is always to you know brief the board of the rules once the draft kind of the changes are are, are presented have a discussion and then plan at the same way we plan for an agenda for a meeting, take input from the board on what topics they want to discuss at the agenda. And those could be, you know, the rules as a whole or specific items. Staff will bring to the board things that we think at a high level need deliberation around like, should we go left or right on a particular issue uh, that, that we seek the board's input on, mindful that the recommendation will be to go not only as a policy decision, but to satisfy Bagley Keen and open that up for discussion at uh, really all, I, and I appreciate I'll flag the, the flexibility about our in-person meetings. If the board schedules accommodate it, I'm happy to do in-person meetings. I just need the board to be available for those days, um, for multiple days. I expect we'll, we'll, we'll need. Also, um, I just want to I just want to jump in and say staff can't staff an in-person meeting on Saturdays. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah. So so only um, myself and the attorneys. We can't actually have any um, uh, other staff because of. Um, the civil civil uh, uh, kind of overtime requirements and stuff. Thank you. And I also don't want to assume on Saturdays for anybody else. I've just been looking at my calendar and trying to understand what is the like what is an approach that could work. Um. So, Mr. Sotani, you did ask us for input on that. Um, I want to recognize that the board is being asked this without necessarily having their calendars in front of them. Um, but if board members are able to provide some input, maybe sort of general, like I did um, for the executive director, um, would you mind, could you do that, please? That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Sierra, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, just say you can't if you can. No, no, that's fine. Um, for me, actually, during the week, most days, I don't have any days that I cannot attend, you know, unless there's an like, appointment or something like that. But my schedule is more open. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, you've set a standard that's very high. <laughs> um, well, I Lay. am. I am retired. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lay, I'm just I'm you I'm going in order of your boxes. So Mr. Lay. Yeah, my, my schedule is rather, rather fluid, uh, aside from you know, Mondays uh and, and kind of I have a lot of Green Landing Institute uh, meetings on on uh on Friday mornings, but uh, I'm generally rather fluid on, in terms of my schedule availability. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Um, I will make it a priority to make myself available at the days that others are available. And I have some level of flexibility. I have responsibility for my family and I cannot you know, say that's Thursday, Friday, it depends on, on the weeks. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, when Mrs. Urban shared before in terms of her availability. I would very much prefer to avoid meetings on Saturdays. And she's obviously our chair. Um, so that is fairly limited. We're just talking about Fridays potentially. And um, the meetings could last more than one day. So I, I'm not sure if there's a conversation to be had around, um, you know, if, if, if there's a situation where unfortunately the chair cannot be available, is there a meeting that could be had without the presence of the chair in, a, in, a, you know, in, in an emergency? Um, and maybe that's something that we have to put in, in an agenda. Maybe that's something that the chair can think about and suggest. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just break in and say, um, I mentioned Saturdays um, because I know boards sometimes do that and they sometimes meet late into the night. Um, I was not suggesting that other board members needed to make themselves available for Saturdays. I was simply um, providing like an expansive version of my own flexibility. Um, Mr. Thompson? Um, a couple of things. One is, so I feel I've given Mr. Sultani and the staff pretty detailed 
list of when I can be available. Um, I think I have a much Thank greater level of flexibility. Um, I'm not I'm not at the Sierra end of the spectrum, um, but uh, and I'm not going to name the bookends. But I'm not at the Sierra end of the spectrum. But um, I can be I can be flexible. Um, other than you know, th there's not recurring things that that block out entire days on a systematic basis. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And of course, some of this for every board member, I'm sure, will be influenced by like how many meetings. Um, you know, it's easy to um, to make uh, create flexibility x number of times, and then maybe that y time it's not it's not as um, as feasible. Um, so, Mr. Sultani, is that helpful? Yeah, what I might propose is you know I have I have um, Thursday afternoons and Friday uh, afternoons. Um, or, or late morning to afternoon as availability. What I might do is send to the board specific dates for some planned um, uh, plan meetings um, in the coming months and get confirmation. And then we'll hold those as what staff can work towards for um, for these the rulemaking hearings. Um, I'll take you know the input on this process. If there are any tweaks that we encounter because we're like, oh, Bagley Keen doesn't let us like do something, we will flag that and perhaps even talk that as, as the first agenda on item of that meeting if the board really feels strongly that we should deliberate about that point. But otherwise we'll proceed with the guidance here, which is we'll brief individual members about the, the rules, if they have any questions, plan to deliberate on issues that their the staff either feel or where the board feel like um, they wanna provide input on and then just proceed with scheduling these meetings and hitting our marks uh, in terms of our rulemaking. That's what I'm gonna go forward with. Um, based on this discussion, Thank and, you. And, I'll, and I'll again, I'll, I'll I'll hold the I'll try to get folks availability in person, but um, we'll also flag that um, we'll have some flexibility there. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, uh, I really appreciate the robust discussion, the continued work of the process subcommittee. Uh, I would now like to take public comment. If you'd like to make a public comment, please uh, raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature. Um, we have Mr. Chappelle. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Sultani, and thanks to everybody in the board. Um, boy, this has really opened my eyes to uh, how complex the, the process here is and how much work is going in uh, to, to, to move this forward. Um, so, but my comment is with respect to an eventual enforcement date. Um, I, if, if I've missed it, I apologize. And please, someone just jump in and correct me. But it, it doesn't seem like we have a, an enforcement date. And it's certainly not out of the question that, that the, the, the finalization of the guidance document would take place after Jan 1, 2023. And so I, I would just implore the board at the next opportune moment to clarify to the business community, you know, what, what, the, what the intention is with respect to enforcement of this rule set. Because I think we've reached the point where it's creating confusion and potentially harming the business community. Uh, I, I'll just note that uh, it's not uncommon for internet-based businesses to have code freezes in Q4. Um, but that may be a moot point because it's not even clear that we're gonna be ready by in Q4. Um, and, and perhaps some of this is driven by the notion that we're only talking about an hour and a half of compliance person hours to, to adhere to the rule set. Um, and if that's the case, um, that, that would be unfortunate because for many businesses, it's gonna take significantly more time than that. So uh, I don't know if this is something that I, I need to re-comment on later when the we're talking about agenda items for next time. Um, I, I, I may be able to be here. I've got a childcare issue, but boy, I would just implore the board uh, to provide the marketplace some clarity on that issue because I think it's an important one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chappelle. I appreciate it. It is uh, best um, to bring up something new like this or, you know, not 
central to the discussion we've been having um, on agenda item nine. Mr. Souble, um, can we say that we've noted it at least? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chappelle. Is there further public comment? Please raise your hand. Yep. The Zoom. I'm sorry, there's a, there's someone connected. I heard a public comment. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Robin West, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. And And I know there's been a lot of thank yous, but thank you again for all the long hours that all of you have been putting in. So it's remarkable. And I'm extremely excited about your committee and about all of this legislation. And I wanted to also... Um, address this to Mr. Thompson. Uh, I understand, I think he said earlier, he was um, on the public. Hello? Yes, sorry. Yes, Ms. West, so we I'm heard- sorry. Uh, that's all right. We heard uh, up to Mr. Thompson is on the public. So if you could start from there. Yes, public uh, on the Public Awareness Committee. And um, my background is in promotional uh, sales. And uh, I'm interested in either volunteering or working on that committee. Um, I have uh, demonstrated abilities to be very influential in the sales arena throughout my career. And uh, I'm so passionate about what you're doing. And uh, so I just would like to be considered for one of those positions. And I'll go online and take a look and see what there is. But uh, I just wanted to sort of put that out there. Uh, I also wanted to add that I've made two C uh, PPA requests of Nordstrom and they've ignored me. And um, I have a very, very high credit score, an A1 credit rating for 35 years, and they're not complying with my request. And on uh, September 3rd, they canceled my uh, visa card. I had a $24,000 line of credit, and I had two disasters at my home 10 years ago, I, and I used the card. I had to live in hotels. And I finally got the card paid off. I think it was uh, just in the last several months. So there's no more interest that they're earning off of me, but I feel that taking away such a you have high 30 credit seconds. line. That, 30 oh, seconds. okay. Well, I wanted to add that. And I guess uh, I need, I wanted to also add if regulations at CCPA received my email of September 1st. And, and I know you can't do anything yet that I have to go to the attorney general and, you know, until I guess next July. But I just, you know, I wanted to also add that and find out, you know, if, if the regulations received my email that I sent with some of those details. Thank you, that is your time. Thank you very much, Ms. West. Are there any further public comments? Please raise your hand if you have uh, a comment using the Zoom raise hand feature. I see none. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani, and thank you again to the subcommittee for its careful thought and work and to the board for a careful discussion um, of this important issue as we move into the substance of considering the comments for the proposed rules. We're going to take a short break um, and then come back um, for our next agenda item, which is the opportunity um, for general um, public comment. Uh, so um, is 10 minutes good? Do pe what, what would you people need? Just if you can put it up. I have a I have a hard stop at, at 145. Um, so I'll have to drop off um, then. Okay. Okay. So would you rather we didn't take a break or you're just letting us know? If, if everyone's okay with just kind of pushing through, um, hopefully these last two agenda items um, 
won't take sure. us through that. Um, that's absolutely fine with me. Is everybody else okay? That's my preference as well. Okay, wonderful. Let's keep going then. Um, uh, thanks again for um, all the work on all the agenda items so far. Um, let's move to uh, agenda item number eight, in which we invite public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, before we proceed with public comment, um, please do note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether uh, it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. I know it can seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, but following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the rules of the Bag the Keen Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. So we do not intend to seem unresponsive um, and we will listen. With that, I will ask um, if there is public comment, um, general public comment, Mr. Sultani. Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment. I see one hand raised. Mr. Uh, Baca. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon. I just have a quick question. I cannot decipher if uh, this is a period right now for um, just listening, although it is, it, it will, what I don't understand this distinguishing factors between eight and nine on the agenda, as I would like to prov provide um, a new item. And it has to do with um, um, a potential regulatory framework outside of the period. Can um, Jennifer please uh, distinguish the two? Um, so the agenda item nine is specifically um, for suggestions for agenda items for future um, meetings. This item is an opportunity for the public to comment on any topic, whether or not it's on the agenda. Um, so um, if the comment that you would like to make um, is uh, that this is an issue that's important to you, please go ahead and you can bring it up again um, as a specific agenda item. But after Mr. Soublet's um, answer to my question earlier, uh, I think that um, it is, we can, we can take it, we can sort of, we can take note of it so that you know that we heard it. Um, I realize that the rules are a little bit Baroque and I hope that helps. It does. <clears throat> With that said, I, I reserve the right that this comment will apply for either um, item number eight or nine on the agenda. Um, with that said, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rafa Baca. I'm an attorney and I'm commenting today in a personal capacity. Um, definitely, I want to thank the board and the director for all of the hard work that they've done so far. This is my first meeting. I just found it just incredibly impressive what the drive is. So obviously the comment that I would like to make as I mentioned before is the comment is now being received outside of the period as stated earlier. This has to do with the proposed regulatory framework to consider and to expand upon and for historical memory. That being said, I would like to talk about the digitaldeputyact.org. I believe this digitaldeputyact.org is a revenue neutral way of enforcing the agency's regulations outside of the agency, external to the agency per se. Much of digital data privacy requires some level of technical expertise. My idea, which is indeed the digitaldeputyact.org as a uh, in coming personally, right? You have 30 is, seconds. Is to provide licensure to software professionals by enforcing the rules of the agency um, <clears throat> at the time it's being developed in day-to-day -day operations. Uh, the, um, I have a law review article, a national publication and peer review by lawyers on the same. Uh, the engineer at this time, it is revenue neutral in the sense that it's a component of the potential I'm sorry, what did you say? 
that is that is your time. Okay, you thank three you. minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there further public comment? Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment. Mr. Philip Gutierrez, you have three minutes. Please unmute yourself. Good afternoon. This is Philip Gutierrez with Schools First Federal Credit Union. I want to thank the board for the opportunity to provide comments. Since neither Bill AB 2891 nor AB 2871 passed the legislature this year, employee and business to business data will be subject to the CCPA effective January 1st, 2023. I'd like to ask the agency board members to delay enforcement action to a later date so businesses have sufficient time to comply with the employee and business to business requirements. I ask the, the board to address this via public announcement that would greatly uh, be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Is there further public comment? Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment. I see uh, no hands raised, zero hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Sultani, and thank you very much to the members of the public who took the time to both come to the meeting and give us um, their thoughts. Let us now turn um, to agenda item number nine, which is a discussion of future agenda items. So during this agenda um, item, we have the opportunity for members of the board um, and or members of the public to suggest items for future um, for future uh, board meetings. Um, I have a bit of an update from our last list. So um, one was, of course, to take up whether to put out the notice of proposed rulemaking, which the board has done. One was strategic planning, um, which we talked about earlier today. One was a budget update, which we also talked about earlier today. Um, and one was an agenda item about processing proposed changes to the rules, which the um, process subcommittee did all of that very helpful work on and we discussed today. Um, we also, of course, have a focus on rulemaking substance um, coming up, um, input by the board on relevant um, positions, as we discussed under the delegation of authority today, um, and um, occasional and continuing reports from subcommittees as necessary. Um, uh, uh, so, excuse me. Um, uh, so now I would like to please open it up to board members. Oh, hang on. Sorry, one thing. Um, I believe that Ms. De La Torre um, would like to add an agenda item about the per diem. Um, so I, that is actually on the list, but of course you can bring it up in more detail if you would like. Um, Mr. Lay. Yeah, so um, yeah, quickly before I have to go, uh, I just want to add the item that we brought up during the update, um, uh, our subcommittee update around public awareness to talk about and consider proposals so that we can provide guidance to businesses regarding potential actions that we can do and, and considerations around delay in enforcement and how that, uh, or delay in regulations and how that can impact our enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. De La Torre? Apologies. Um, yes. So my item is really regarding the budget process. Through the budget process, there is one of the um, uh, actions that the agency can take is uh, request a change in the per diem. And I would like to add that to our agenda, preferably uh, before we file our budget, because it's related to the budget process. Got it, thank you very much. Other yeah, agenda? I, I have to, I have to drop Lee. off, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. Thank you for all of your service today and for, for all of your work generally. Thank you. Thanks so thank much. You. Uh, further agenda items from board members? Mr. Thompson? Um, if if we propose an agenda item, we could change our mind. It does not have to be on the agenda. Right? The reason I'm bringing this up is no, we will we not hold you to this for all time. 
<laughs> forever. Um, there was some ambiguity on whether or not we needed any further discussion of the process by which we're going to do consider changes to the rules. So I think we should just consider put it, having that on the agenda. We don't have to do it, but uh, if there is a need for further clarification, we might want to agendize that. Yes, my understanding was that we would move forward, but of course, if staff runs into something, um, it's obviously up for um, addition to an agenda, I, to a future agenda. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Subai. I just want to point out that we currently have four board members, so we still have a quorum present for the meeting. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Stiblay, for reminding me to establish that. Um, we do still have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, further agenda items from board members? Okay, thank you all very much. Um, are there suggested agenda items from members of the public? Please raise your hand using the Zoom raised hand feature uh, and you will be asked to unmute. Um, we have a few comments. Very good. Mr. Uh, or I'm gonna, I'm, I apologize in advance. Olum, uh, O-L-U-M-E-S-E. -E. You have three minutes. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you for allowing my comment. My name is Ahijale Alumise, and I'm an attorney at Cooley, where we are advising a number of clients on CCP compliance. As you know, the California legislature did not act on proposals to further extend the CCPA's so-called HR and B2B exemptions, which are set to expire on January 1st, 2023. Businesses now have only little more than three months to comply with the CCPA, as applied to this currently exempt data, which includes personal information about job candidates, employees, and a wide range of business, business contacts among other categories of individuals. Never before have US businesses been required to address these categories of data under federal or state privacy law of general application, and none of the other comprehensive privacy laws adopted in other US states will require them to do so. Yet neither the CPPA nor the Attorney General have provided guidance on this topic. Accordingly, we urge the board to address the following question at its next public meeting. Number one, what guidance, if any, can business, businesses expect from the CPPA prior to January 1, 2023, on how to address their obligations related to this data, whether within the first set of CPPA regulations to take effect or pursuant to the CPPA's authority to provide guidance to businesses beyond the four corners of the regulation? And number two, what if any leniency can businesses expect in the enforcement of the CCPA as applied to the HR and B2B data, whether through a formal grace period, regulation providing compliance flexibility, extensions of care periods, or otherwise? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olumise. Uh, next comment, please. Please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment. I see Mr. Uh, Baca. Mr. Baca, you have three minutes. Please Hello, um, I'm Rafa Baca. Uh, I would like to at least suggest perhaps extending um, an opportunity for discussing further regulatory frameworks outside of the period, perhaps including the digitaldeputyact.org. With that said, I am the author of that. And there are some, in, in, there's some ideas that I would like to convey and to conclude that uh, was previously addressed in section eight. The idea is to provide state licensure to software professionals to assist in enforcing the rules of the agency at the time software is being developed in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, at this time, engineers, scientists, lawyers, doctors are licensed by the state and often uphold the rules of ethics and are required to be knowledgeable to so um, understand state laws and regulations. This revenue neutral idea in a sense is a component of their licensure 
and the renewal fees or annual renewal fees that they must interact with the regulatory agency authority of this agency and thus professionals who pay the state for such a licensure. Again, I do have a, a law review article. Um, I'm more than willing to provide that at the proposed new agenda item. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Are there further comments? Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment. You can also press star nine on your cell phone if you're dialing in to raise your hand. I see no hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Thank you to members of the board and the public um, for comments on this agenda item. And uh, we will now turn to agenda item number 10, which is adjournment. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, board members, staff, and members of the public um, who were wonderfully engaged today for their contributions to the meeting and to the board's work. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. We have a motion to adjourn the meeting from Ms. De La Torre and a second from Ms. Sierra. And I will remind um, everyone that we do still have a quorum of four members. Mr. Suble, could you please call the vote? Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. We have four ayes and one uh, absent. Thank you very much, Mr. Sible. The motion to adjourn has been approved by a vote of four to nothing with one um, person absent. And this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is adjourned with my thanks to you all.